G'day, it is AOS Coach here with the man flu. So if I sound extra twangy, I do apologize. I've got some lens sip, but nothing was going to stop me from streaming this particular episode. I'm here with Razor Ramon himself, uh, Ramon Silva, um, who Hello. is a very, very good player, ranked currently 10th on the ITC, but more importantly, someone who's been doing incredibly well in the competitive scene. And we've been talking for a long time, like over a year, and we, we came up with this idea and something that I haven't touched on for a while in the channel, something I've wanted to do for a long time, is how on earth do you deploy? And I know that's a lot of questions. And like, I've talked to a lot of people and we've discussed over time the importance of deployment and how a lot of people don't put enough emphasis on deployment. How do I deploy? Where do I deploy? And the importance of actually thinking through your deployment. So Ramon is going to help me unpack this and we're going to really try to understand how do you make the most of deployment when you can't just do like this one trick pony. So that's kind of the premise. And we're going to try to kind of capture as many different armies as possible, show you some examples, and we're going to bring up some visual aids as well to help us. But we're going to try to help you with tools to help you do good deployment. But before we get into that, I'll throw it over to you. Do you want to introduce yourself other than being an awesome player? Um, where are you from? I'm from SoCal, California. Uh, I'm part of uh, Scalies. We're going to become SoCal Eternals, but we're... SoCal United right now. Um, and I've been playing in uh, Southern California, San Diego for about two and a half years. I started the hobby because I wanted to have a thing I could do with my wife. And she did play for the first year, um, but now she mainly paints. So, but I, I do, um, I started the hobby playing a lot of chess before I got into the hobby. So I, I started knowing I was going to be a very competitive gamer. And so I was always looking to how to compare it to chess and so a quick thing is in chess you start off everything's already deployed you you already have where it's going to go so there's no deployment in chess there's just an opening and this is one of those few games where you actually get to work or figure out where you're going to place your queen where you're going to place your pawns before you actually start the game and then to unpack what i hope we do is help people understand what pieces are their pawns and what pieces are their queens before they try to deploy them. Imagine a game of chess where you could actually, there was no rules. You could actually deploy wherever you wanted to. Like that, that'd be a cracking game of chess. I don't know, like you probably break the hearts and minds of people, but that's kind of like how it is, right? Like, you know, with chess, you've got this very set defined, this is what I do. But in Age of Sigma, and it's become really confusing. The, the grandmasters actually switch the pieces around. They play a different game, like chess 3, 960, I think, is where the pieces are actually moved around different than the initial. So they have to try to work through the same tactics, but not with the memorization of how all the games work from before. So, and it's it's when you get into positions, that's the thing. You got to look at the pieces just like how they're supposed to be positioned outside of the battle plans and outside of themselves, just how the pieces themselves should work and then apply that to the battle plans. Um, and it was just easy because I did it with chess beforehand. There's a lot of similar things I'm going to bring up that like the idea of pinning a piece or the idea of forking a piece is it's the same in Sigma. It's just, it looks different. So let's go to ground zero. Why is deployment important? It, it's the phase in which you plan out the rest of the game. So it's the place where you can make the most mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, when I think about deployment, I think about it not as just something you do. It's actually a phase. And I go into deployment wanting to win the phase. So when I roll off to go who gets to set up the terrain or who gets to go first or who uh, gets to choose which side of the table and I'm looking at the different types of, you know, terrain pieces and if they miss mystical or deadly or I'm thinking about that as like I want to win that battle. I want to make the most of the terrain and I want to get an advantage through deployment. Yep. Yep. It's different because in a chess, again, you, you, you have to do the opening to get to that advantage. But in our game, you can actually deploy with an advantage. If, if you know that you want a piece of arcane terrain and you know that you 
are having a bunch of sorcerers, you, you'll deploy near it and that's automatically just an easy advantage right there. Um, and so that's what we're kind of gonna go through the, the little pieces, but we also wanna go through a broad idea of it and then back down to the little pieces too. So it's fun. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the key, right? Because when I, when we talk about deployment, I, I wish I could give people the silver bullet to say, if you play Flesh Eater Courts, this is the one holy grail way to, to play to Flesh Eater Courts. And then I give you the tools for Gloom Spike Gits. But fundamentally, it changes whether it is um, the army that I'm playing, it is the opponent that I'm playing, the battle plan that I'm playing on. The um the deployment zones, the terrain features on the on the table. There are so many variables, and for me, when I try to go to a tabletop, I try to use those variables to try to make the best decision possible. Because ultimately, if I don't do well, if I make a bad deployment mistake, I don't want to say I can lose the game in deployment, but it makes my battle an uphill battle. And there is a psychological game in deployment as well, where and this is kind of the where I haven't been a psychological game. Yeah, Sorry. and I think that's kind of where the no, 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 not at all, not at all. I'm kind of like just trying to paint the picture of why deployment really matters and why you want to practice this. Why every game that I play, I take a photo of my deployment so I can reflect upon later and go right. What did I do well? What did I don't do well? What do I want to replicate across the event or at my next my my next game? What, what are the, some of the things that I could do differently next time? And we'll use those visual aids as well as, as we go through. But yeah, for me, t deployment is very much a phase that I want to get the front foot. I guess that's a good first tip to say, like, if you're really worried about it, always take a picture of your deployment. That's the easiest thing to, to, to take a picture of because you're going to remember it almost like before, like halfway through the game. Like sometimes you have some awesome fights between two big monsters and you're like oh i want to take a picture of this but deployments that one where you're like oh our armies are all out on the field so let's take a picture for a second and if you actually go back and look at the tapes like you do in football or stuff you you can see how you're like oh i deployed this here thinking i was going to do this and then when you think through the game you're like oh well that didn't really happen so or it did and i'm going to do that again so that's where taking a picture of deployment would be a good way of working your way through getting better at it so something you and i do innately but i think that's just a good tip for everyone else yeah no absolutely like the the, the two things that i always do is take a photo with my opponent take a photo of deployment and then i'll take photos throughout the game but i'll never forget why deployment became important to me um people who follow the channel for a long time know that I play Warhammer Fantasy Battles. I played it from like third edition, right? And there was no such thing as a turn one charge. There was no such thing. You kind of slowly advanced up the board. You kind of tweaked and kind of ranked and flanked and wheeled and you eventually got in, right? And I, I still remember first edition, and I can see Gareth in the chat. He's going to laugh at me in a second. But I'll never forget in first edition Age of Sigma, one of the most terrifying things that could happen in the game was blood letters blood letters could turn one charge you um and and it horrified me because because back in the day your general was the only person who could issue a command and they only had one command point um the, you know there was there was no, no redeploy there was all these things right and my army would just crumble with these 120 blood letters that would hit a turn one charge i'll never forget it and i said to myself after this one tournament what can I do differently? And I tried this idea. I thought, what if I don't deploy on the line? What if I pull back? Can they hit the charge? And I worked out that if I deploy on my seven inch line, not on my 12 inch line, it was physically impossible for corn to, to charge one, charge me. And all you of a sudden I, I did the maths. I'm like, right. Seven inches is a, it, near it. Like, they cannot physically do it. And it was at that point I went, right, I'm going to learn how to really deploy properly. I'm going to think about de my deployment and not just my bubbles and where I want to have like my boosts, but like really think about this properly. So that's kind of like where I want to kind of share my thoughts. Do you want to add anything to that before we get into the topic? Uh, yeah, just the, the quick little tidbit on how I've been in a player. I've always been an alpha strike in your face charge. <laughs> so that's, that's all I've won. The majority of the things I've won is taking that alpha strike type list. It's it's funny that you bring that up. See, I'm the opposite. I'm the opposite. 
I hate I, I hate battle regiment. Um, I'm a, I'm a counter type player. I'm somebody who likes to survey the battlefield. I like to string out my deployment, and I like to counter and like basically adapt to to the game. So I think it's kind of like the different styles. But what armies do you play? So um, I have played uh, Stormcast and Nighthunt. I started with Soul Wars. So my wife bought lady olinder because of liking her like it was it was really funny i just play a lot of video games and i walked past the gw store and i was like oh i think i can get my wife into this and paint it and so we got night hunt and then i got stonecast because i like chess i was like oh i'm gonna build it up so it's like a chess board on both sides and that totally didn't happen but um then i actually took best in stonecast last year because of the one drop list, which was the, the shoot cast list and watching uh, you interview a guy last year and go over the whole thing actually really helped me understand how to use it too. Um, so thank you for all that you do for the community or maybe people in SoCal kind of don't like you for having me take Raptors so often, but um, you are one of the reasons I did it. And it, with that, that's how I actually got that. Uh, and then what had happened was I, I won, um, I won SoCal Open with a really funny list, and I got, uh, <laughs> I, I, I got a bunch of fulminators from it, and that's when the meme came out about, um, oh, you can't move after translocate because they read they changed the translocate back to how it's supposed to be, and so there's like, oh, but you can move fulminators after you shoot, and so <laughs> I just ran that for like the last eight months, and now I'm going to be running Nikon, and so um th those are my two very alpha strike armies and now i'm actually taking the not one drop type of army i'm taking the, the counter punch list and trying to work into playing more defensively the problem with it, is it just makes the games take a lot longer for for me so but um that's a different point all entirely i want to bring up a comment that gareth mentioned which i, I think is an interesting one right because there's the whole game about deployment and a lot of people unless you're like really aggressive they want to give away the first turn hopefully go for a double turn but also it allows your opponent to move forward potentially make early mistakes and i, I like to see deployment the same way because often i'll take an army that might have 10 drops 9 drops 12 drops I'll, I'll bait my opponent. I'll put it a little thing over here and try to make them think that I'm deploying here and then swerve and put a lot of my army on the other side. So there's a lot of psychological things that we can do through deployment. And one of the reasons why I wanted to ask you what armies you play is, correct me if I'm wrong, and I know I'm not going to be wrong, but each deployment is going to be different for each army. Because I play Gloomspike Gits, I play Gargans, I play Cities of Sigma, I play um, Nighthorn, not Nighthorn, um, uh, Soul Black Grave Lords um, back in the day. I play all these different armies, Daughters of Cain, and they all deploy very differently. Every build is very different as well. Would you would you say that's that's true of your armies? Hundred percent. Yep. No, I. Um, what's funny is at SoCal Open, I took Gavin, who took LVOs. Uh, who won LVO, I took his exact version of the list, uh, which has fulminators. It's this living cities list. And it's not the way I play it. Like it, I, I actually played it wrong. I made a mistake using his list because I always have a pinning piece and I play uh, it differently with about 500 points. And it, it just, it's a, it's a much different game um, just with just 500 points being different in the list. 1500 is all the same, but and I think that's true with any army. I can't actually see the chat. So I see you smiling. Over what's going on. It's all good. No, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm smiling at you, but I'm also smiling at the chat because I was just thinking for a second, like Joseph saying, I hope you give shout outs to people like Bastion. Like, and I'm, I, at first I was like, why am I shouting out Bastion? Like shout out Bastion. But it's actually because- Bastion! But what I was thinking about is there's absolutely part of this is the fact that there are parts of the army where you can redeploy parts of the parts of your army at the end of the game. You know, we saw Thomas Juan, um, Juan um, at the Texas Masters use pre-game movement with his big stabbers. There are so many armies, like I was talking to, to um, Daniel from the Stormkeep, you know, he uses a lot of armies coming in from reserve with his Stormcast. 
So deployment isn't just what you put on the table. It's all the things that happen before the game starts. And there's a lot of things you can do. Soulbite players know it from like putting it into grave sites, garrisoning. I know my Gloomspite have recently Dating. been. This, the psychological part, because you, you're getting to the idea of not just what you physically do with the pieces, but how you, you, up, how you make your opponent do different things with their pieces because of how you put your pieces down. And that's the big thing about deployment that you can try to win. Um, and that's like the simple thing is like, you're like, hey, I don't ever want to take a one drop. Well, I always take a one drop or a low drop because I always win on who gets to choose who's going first or not. And I get to win on the double turn. You know, and so that's one advantage that low drops give you, but it has a lot of disadvantages to it that you have to be willing to sacrifice. And so that's, but you, you know, that you, you know, your strength is in deployment. That's why it's always been what I take. Whereas if, if people know their strength is figuring out the game later on, they might want to work on deployment a little bit, but, and that's the thing in chess, there's, there's the middle game and there's the end game. And if you, you're better off in the end game and stuff like that work on deployment but focus on what you're good at and that is for everybody too but we're working on deployment today <laughs> so. no 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 it, but, it, but it's all very valuable and um you know like i was look, looking at adam phyllis comment earlier like you know nighthorn are doing really well nighthorn absolutely are doing well not just for the the deployment shenanigans but this game is a movement game it's not specifically a combat game it's not a magic game it's all about movement and the flexibility that things that can come in from reserve, being able to redeploy um, models before Retreat the game charges. starts. Yes. There is so much that, that goes into this. And I guess that's why you need to think about your toolkit. That's why pre-game moves become really important and why that Warcry Warband, what's the, um, I can't think what it's called. Um, the, or, or, the, un un the Untamed Beast. The Untamed, Untamed Beast. Beast, yeah, yeah. From pre Warcry. Pre-game movement. Yeah, but like, you know, those types of things become really important because it, Add an, an, another piece of value. Well, look, we're getting into the weeds here. We're going to bring up the slides, I think, pretty soon. Two things I want to ask is, before we get to the slides, is um, what's the benefits of deploying correctly? So if I get my deployment effective and I feel confident about doing a good deployment, what are the benefits and why should I practice it? Um, the big thing about getting your deployment correctly is – you should be able to get at least three to four of your own battle tactics and half of the primaries without the opponent even being on the field. Like you should try to think of that as your, your deployment, you know, and that way, you know, you have at least 15 to 20, it depends on how it's scored, but you have at least half of the stuff done before you have to do the math of what you have to face. And so that's why getting that, part of the deployment done where you you know where you, you have to move to do that before you go on the board and how the terrain is going to kind of affect that is really what deployment means you got to kind of look at how the terrain versus the battlefield makes you either able to get those three that you have already planned out or makes it harder for you to get those three that you have planned out and then the other two that are battle plan and army dependent um how you plan for those ones so it's sorry my wife threw me off she she came in and told me something no. No, <laughs> sorry, sure, sure. look there's no coaching here on the on the channel she can't wife can't just give you tips that you've forgotten about um but like when i when i thought about this like i was thinking about this question i'm like what are the benefits of getting my my deployment right um you know when i when i get to my deployment right i feel confident i go to the table and i go look I don't have to take first and I don't have to be aggressive. You know, if I win the priority role and normally I'm a defensive armies, but I mess up, sometimes I've got to take the first turn just to fix up my mistakes. So you don't kind of like take real advantage of it. I, and, and I'm, I'm confident to give away the turn. I'm like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm pretty comfortable right now. I'm in my little, my buff auras. I can issue commands. Um, everything that I need is available to me. You can take it. You can take it. I don't need it. I, I, do you feel the same way? Yeah. That you're getting on the idea of battle morale and like how to keep your own morale up during the game. And when you, and I went to the wheat of it, but when you, when you know that you're going to get your three or you're going to get at least a couple of your battle tactics just from how you're deployed, 
then you feel confident going into that game, no matter what you're facing on the other side of the table. So, yeah. And, and you're confident because you are confident in your layout. You're confident in your buff ranges and auras and being able to issue commands. You're confident in scoring battle tactics because you know that with X measurement, you can, you can get onto an objective or, you know, with movement plus forward to victory command, you can get X amount of models on, um, but also it allows you to kind of get your battle tactics because well, you know changed too, <laughs> they have, they have like, and I think last season when we had like the run three monsters to get all the, all the VPs in the world, you had to make sure that you deployed them and they all could actually get within three, especially if your monsters didn't fly. I've had to give back. I, I, I would typically let people do that one over if they messed it up. But I, I, I've seen that about, six or seven times in the last 20 games that I've played before this new GHB. And so it's just people, people, you need to move on the board. And if you get your deployment right, you're going to get to move on the board <laughs> where you want to go. And that's the kind of thing that you really want to think of when you're putting your pieces down is where they're going to go. Speaking of movement, Gareth mentioned in the, and a hundred percent, this is a great comment. You know, movement is probably the only aspect of our game that isn't dice dependent. So it's always under our control. So you can go in knowing, um, you, you know, your combinations, right? You know, your movement, movement plus run, movement plus run and charge, movement plus charge, movement plus buff. So, you know, you can think about what you need in order to apply it. To, to do whatever, whatever it's the charge, whether it is the objective, whether it is the screening, there's all these things that you need to think about, but also it's always in your control. So good, good comment there from Gareth. And that's why I, in these slides that we're going to show soon, I was hoping to give visual aids of how to look at that actual, because you did the same thing too, where we, I, I see the board a certain way and you do too, because you've always looked at these bubbles in your head and that's what it'll help people if they start looking at those bubbles or those ranges especially with the quadrants as they are now um i don't know if you have the actual gw map but it came with little corners and i love that because it really helps you map out how far your distances are compared to mm. like the regular map that doesn't have the little lines on them and everything like that and so no, and, and it's probably one of the benefits of like tabletop simulators. You can like really, really measure out. That's why the objective ring bubbles are easy to see where the objective is and how many things can get in there. Um, but before I get into the slides, and I, I feel like I'm like trying to tee, like it is coming, like I swear, there's just one more question, folks, one more question. And that is what is the, what happens if you do bad deployment? And we already talked about the fact that you're on the back foot, but why are you on the back foot? What, what happens when you do a poor deployment? You, you have to think of the game as if you're like... <laughs> um, do I love, the chat? So we can call him Gareth and he'll love it. But he, he goes by Tom. Um, and my name currently in ITC is Rayman Silva because you called me Rayman once on a chat so it's it and i call him gareth because that's his name but he likes to go by tom there was this whole yeah um but it, when you start off on the back foot it makes it easier for your opponent to force more like so that there, there's there's two things there's like the board and the problem solving that you have to do there's the actual math that's on the board and then there's your ability as a general to do it you know and those are two different things and your ability as a general to do it is very dependent upon how much you've been drinking or how much you like the game or, or how good or how confident you feel in the game. And when you, when you deploy in a way where you're already like oh, crap, you know, <laughs> like, when you, you know, like I love it. I love it when I'm on the other side of the table and my opponent is visually letting me know that they messed up you know and it, it i only really love it when it's on the top table i don't like it when it's somebody new but it's when, when i have that little bit of an advantage and that's any good player is going to try to really again it's not just what's on the table it's who you're playing and so you want to try to get that psychological edge too and so if you do make a deployment mistake try not to let your opponent know <laughs> i mean that's that's you know i i that would be the thing i would say 
if if you if you're considering it a competitive match if it's one of those yeah. rounds where you you want it to not be super competitive then and that's the thing about tournaments not every not every match is supposed to be a super competitive match it's supposed to be a match where if you go there and you're trying to have a good time you're going to have a good time because there's more people that are not like me who are taking this to the extreme then there are people like me who are trying to work out every single angle and every single number and stuff like that. So, um, and they're a ton of fun. I, I got to shout them all out before I go. We'll do that later. So. In one of the photos I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you where I messed up a deployment so bad. It, it, I deployed. And as soon as the game started, I realized I messed up and the game was over. Like it wasn't literally over at that point, but I knew that the gap that I made was enough. Like it was a, it was a storm cast error. So I basically screened out nine inches and I'd forgotten that with the Lord Imperitant, he could do the seven inch to uh, come from the sky and then charge. And, and uh, what happened? Annihilators come into the backfield. So I screen, I'm like, yes, nine inches. I'm sweet. But I'd completely forgotten about the seven inches because not many people do that. So I'll show you a reason like why, where it comes in as well and, and, and learn from my mistakes too. It was just one of those ones where I'm like, I'm an idiot. Um, you know, Daniel talking about as well, you know, like it, it is a game of options opening and closing as well. So, you know, deployment allows you to, to maximize that. And, you know, to, to, to this point here as well, it, you know, feels like experience in your own army and your opponents is probably an important factor. Absolutely. We'll talk about this first time. First, first, it's about your army, knowing your army, then being able to counter and respond to your opponent. Um, well, I, I did it a cheeky way. I was like, hey, I want to answer the who, what, when, where, why, and how of deployment. But I want to spend a CP to redeploy those questions in a way that where the last thing that you answer is when should I change this for my opponent? Because everything else you should answer first. And, and then you would, it almost becomes intuitive to when you change this for your opponent. So correct. Know your army before trying to worry about every other army. I think that's where you get analysis paralysis, where you're trying to unpack how, how do I deploy against every single army? No, you have about 60 to 70% of your list that's core. You deploy it that way, and then you respond to your opponent. But, hey, look, let's bring up the slides. Let's actually break this down and, um, and, 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 and get into the good stuff. So first things first, we have our starting position. I imagine that I rock up to the table and this is what I see. My opponent's about to, to turn up. Sides haven't been determined. Priority roll hasn't been determined. Um, dice rolls for terrain hasn't been determined yet. What do you think about when you rock up to the table for the very first time? I, I look at the terrain. I, I automatically look for what, well, like how much or how little terrain is on the table. So um like like the picture that we have now has a lot of scatter you know and so that i i would have to clarify that with my opponent and i would normally scrunch that together to be like okay because we like to have eight pieces where i'm from so that's the first thing that i kind of because it's going to mess up where i get to put my pieces so i have to make sure <laughs> it's it's clean yeah, no, it's a really good point because um, like when I look at this table, like, you know, and you can see the bullet points to the side here, you know, first off, well, what battle plan are we playing? Like where, where are the deployments? Am I in a quadrant? Am I compressed in the center? Is it a whole, is there a gap between us? Um, where are the objectives going to be? I think that's a critical piece as well. And, you know, depending on where the objectives are, which are the ones that I want to fight over first? Um, a lot of the armies that I play, don't have the ability to score all of the objectives. It depends on the battle plan. Obviously, there's three of them, different story. But you've often got to claim one or two, and you got to be constantly doing one, two, and more. How do you how do you guys do terrain like normally where you guys are from? I know this is like a side part. Uh, I look 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 to are you talking about what are you talking about specifically? So when when I roll up to a table for the majority, unless I'm out of town. We have the eight pieces like off the side because you know you're gonna get to set them up as defender, and then you 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 roll six or eight dice for the mysterious as well. But the defender gets to set them up, and Tom, who's in the chat, 
is our TO, um, typically has a map for us that we, we kind of, I don't follow it perfectly, um, but you, you kind of follow so that you know where to put stuff. Um, how do you guys normally do that? So we, we don't play with terrain maps. Um, I am thinking about it. I noticed the AOS Worlds introduced some terrain maps and they had two versions, a heavy and a light. Um, traditionally, the way we play in Australia, I'm speaking on behalf of a whole country as opposed to like, I'm sure there's differences, but um, the TO, the tournament organizer would normally set up the terrain. Um, you wouldn't really move it around. And we would have two rules. You would roll off and the opponent would either choose the side or they would choose um, who deploys first. So we don't really have a lot of the terrain manipulation because as a TO, that's a pain in the ass. And we don't really use maps, but that might change in the future. Um, this, by the way, is a home game. It's the only photo that I had that actually had no armies actually on the table. That well, I um, always feel my home game's prettier, a lot with a lot yeah. more scatter and a lot because it just looks prettier. So. Well, you'd, you'd also compress things a little, right? Your, your terrain feature. Hey, look, we're getting into the weeds here. Like, it's, that's probably not important for this discussion. But I think it, what's, what is important is, for example, some of the terrain here on the table, um, let's say the bottom right-hand corner where you've got those Azerite ruins, are those two pieces different terrain pieces or are they um, one piece? Um, where does cover start and finish? You know, having that conversation and kind of getting to some agreements. Um and when I get to a tabletop, regardless if it looks like this or whether it looks like something else, how does the tabletop kind of have lanes? I like to call them lanes. 40K uses the term lanes, mostly because theirs is more like L shapes and like blocks and streets. But where do we navigate to do the fights? And if my opponent has large bases or I have large bases, how easy is it for me, my army to manipulate and move around um, these channels and lanes? Terrain, it's just, it, it was big in my area because coming from ShootCast, we didn't have, an, there's a lot of stuff that you don't know if it's going to be covered, you know? And so like that, the pieces that's in the bottom right that has the woods on top or has the little piece of like where you can stand on the bottom right corner of this picture in between that gated area, can you see through it? Can you not? Can you shoot through it? You know, and that, that whole thing was so difficult that I actually just made a bunch of foam pieces that was clear line of sight blockers and you could hide behind and that that's the first thing i do when i get to the table so i try to i try to clarify <clears throat> the terrain with my opponent so that we know exactly what you can shoot through and what's the if, is it within an inch or is it on the the piece itself kind of thing so um and and that's why i asked too because before uh we set up the table we have the terrain to the side and then we put the objective markers on and then we set up the terrain depending upon mm -hmm. the objective markers in your situation it's going to already be set up so you already get to walk up to the table and see your lanes whereas i actually get to half the time create my lanes and so it's a little different that's that's the only reason why that's what i do when i first walk up so i think the other consideration as well is um and, and i'm willing to say this is that I'm willing to give up arcane terrain. I think when we get to the tabletop, a lot of people will go for the tape, the side that has arcane just to get that increased boost. There's a lot of times where I'll give it away because I feel like the, the layout of how I deploy my army and the channels and where I fight and what's going to be easier for me and better for me actually is on the other side, as opposed to taking away because my armies usually use mystical and arcane. I'm happy to give it away. That's not, that's not the driver for me. Nice. Because lost, a lot of the time, my wizard's not sitting on that arcane terrain forever. So just something to consider as well. Um, Figuring out but, what piece of terrain is bait for your yeah, opponent absolutely. or for yourself. Um, shout out as well to Zach. Thank you for the super chat. Much appreciated. Um, saying, hey, Ramon, thank you for the hotel um, lobby prep talk at B B the, Bay the Bay Area Open. The social arm um, wrestling component of competitive play is new to me. Um, that's awesome. No, thank you. And, um, you're, you're in good hands. Thank you. But yeah, look, look, I think, look, you got your starting table. I think we kind of nailed this a little bit. There's some components you need to think about. It's the deployment zones and where the objectives are going to be. Steal from the best. <laughs> it's the correct way to do it. So. Yeah, I, I'm definitely thinking about bringing um, deployment maps for my next grand tournament. Um, it I shouldn't think be a monopoly though. So people should challenge him, but he, I, I I, I do bow down to my local TO and say he is he is a saint. He is he is Thank made. You. Thank <laughs> you for keeping it ahead. 
Don't give him <laughs> too big of a head. Let's get into this. We'll keep, we're only scratching the surface here. The next one is, you know, army composition. And I'm going to throw this one over to you first. What were you, What are you thinking here when it comes to army composition and the way it, it, deployment comes in? So, like, it's it's more if you look at the War Scrolls themselves and you look at how the War Scrolls work with each other, you know, and so that's you're going to look at the movement characteristic. And the, the bottom point that I make is, you know, you, you're going to have a 10 inch move. You don't want to put a six inch or you don't want to put that four inches behind a six inch move because they'll both be at the same place. And and looking at how your pieces move, not just through one turn, but th through two turns, like just just take the pieces that you want to play with, you know, and just nothing else, just movement, just try to see where they move and how you would want them to move. Cause if you think that piece is your tanky piece, or if you think that piece is your attacking piece, or if you think, and you know, it's a shooting piece, you know, you don't want it to get into the front. And so that's kind of, you want to look at that part of the pieces movement. So the movement becomes a bubble for you. And like, what it needs so if it's a shooting piece it needs a thing in front of it and, and you start creating those in your head alongside the aura bubbles of of what gives it benefits because we already know benefit pieces are are themselves and so you can break your army into three or four different parts you know it's it's everyone has to have battle line and that's usually going to be about 500 points everybody's going to have a couple of heroes 500 points and then you're going to have another 500 points of what you're what you're taking you're either tanky or stuff like that so you want to you want to start thinking of what that is and and you normally already have like it, everybody's at least at that point but really doing it again <laughs> you know just being like okay what is this actually doing for my whole army is this like in in individual pieces so each 500 points or each 300 points that are a power pair and stuff like that how what is that actual tool um like when i took fulminators they, they would charge they do 84 damage on the charge they can move so that they're within three inches you know 84 damage on the charge uh, that's just the amount of damage that can be total and then how often that will happen you can change with the the pluses to the hit and the pluses to the wound because the triumph and everything like that but you know that lists sometimes don't even have 84 wounds, you know, and that's only 460 points of my army. And so that's what that does, you know, and, and, and it does it so well because I can put it where I want it to. And I know how to manipulate a charge. And th that's what I learned how to do. You know, I knew that I needed to make that eight, that 84 damage be crucial. So I learned how to, you, you pick the first target with the thing you charge, and then you have your other piece of your, your fulminators go to the actual thing you want to hit, you know? And so you have to hit the thing that's closest to you, but you actually can go with the, the, I always had gotten two on the back end into whatever you didn't want me to get it into because I, I charged the unit that they were closest to, but still had enough distance to pile into that unit as well. And you get used to using your pieces as what they're supposed to do and then maximizing what they're supposed to do. And that's where army composition is not, your whole list it's how independent parts work inside of your list so and, and that's how you that's how i think about breaking down my army right you i want to talk, talk this concept called power pairs it's something that is pretty common to people who are quite competitive but maybe it's a term that people aren't familiar with the way i like to build my list is i like to have like three or four threat pieces they're things that I can rely on as either my anvil that's going to be holding an objective and it can absorb a lot of damage or my hammer that's going to go out there and it's going to punch you in the face and, and probably do really well. And Age of Sigma Warhammer, probably 40K is the same thing, is a war scroll can be good, but it can be even better through a hero, uh, a monster, some type of ability, a spell, something, you know, a combination of some degree. And often you'll find a unit might be supported by a hero. That could be called a power pair. So when I think about my deployment, I'm always deploying in pairs. So I'm like, right, I'm going to put down X unit supported by X unit or X hero. Or some, some of my units, let's say a Phoenix Guard unit, a 500-point unit, might be worth having two heroes supporting it. It might be the Anointed on Foot and a Battle Mage. Um, other ones might be more okay. Well, I'm going to have um, a really powerful unit of shooters, 
but I'm always going to deploy a unit of chaff idiots that can die quickly and absorb the charge. So they're a power pair. And then I might have a hero behind it as well that supports the, the shooters. So it can be trios or, or, or pairs. But, and this is the idea of hammers, anvils, scalpels, and chaff. You know, that's what's your army composition? What, and do they fall into those four different categories? Um, and every army should have something that can die. Like you, you have to have 300 points of these guys are, are here to die so that the rest of everybody can do what they need to do. Like I, I, I believe so. Could we just pick apart bullet point four here? Try to visualize or physically practice optimal deployment and um, how it moves in turn one. What does that mean? That's that's the, the same thing as the next slide or the next bullet point kind of gets at. It's you, a, a lot of people don't take the game outside of the battle plans. You know, they don't just put their models on, on a board and say, okay, how do these things move? And that, that's what I'm trying to say. Like it's don't, don't have anything on the board. Don't have anything else, you know, besides just the models and just, just, just try to see how they would move for two turns and how you could position the, these two power so if it's birds and raptors you know raptors move five inches birds move 12 you know and so you you kind of see like how can i and what's the best place for me to have this on this piece of this board you know and and it's what i did you know and that's that's how i figured out how like bir birds were the mvp in the old book so that the, their counter charge ability is the most the most broken thing there ever was but um it's just knowing how the pieces move themselves, optimal deployment, you, you really don't have to visualize it. You you really should just do it. Just just take the pieces, do it, and then see, like, because everybody kind of has a table that they're, they're, when they're painting, you know, and they're like, okay, I'm building this unit of shooters and I'm building this chaff for it. Well, put it out and then try to move the chaff and then try to move the shit and see where they end up after two turns and just see how the difference between the movement is with an actual ruler with, you know, be as critical on yourself as you can. And, and that's the big thing too, is it's, you got to understand the criticalness of it because when, then when you apply the terrain and you can't land there because of terrain or you apply the enemy models, you can't land because you're within three inches, you already kind of innately feel where they're going to end up. Um, so I make a lot of measurements just like looking at the tabletop. I don't actually have to pull out a ruler as much. And it's because I've done this. So, and, and, and that's kind of what I want to pull out here. And I want to go back even further. What I was hoping you'd expand upon, but you missed it, but I'm going to go to it anyway. It's the middle part of that bullet point where it says physical practice and optimal deployment. It is f at, if you've got a tabletop at home or you have tabletop simulator, the, the, the video game version of Age of Sigma, um, or video game in quotation marks, or even at your next club meet, there's been times in the past where at my club meet, we have practiced turned one deployment where we, we are preparing for a tournament or, you know, we're testing new armies. We're like, right, let's just have a night or at least an hour where all well, my game finishes early. Like, Hey, can we just practice turn one? And you go through the motions of turn one, then you re-rack. Then you go through the motions again, re-rack. And you get a feel of, 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 of what your army can possibly do if you go first or your opponent goes first. If you get this thing off or don't. If you spread out or you castle up or whatever it might be. I guess what I'm talking about is deliberate practice. Don't just rock up to a tournament and just put your toys down and hope for the best. Yep. Have a plan. Have a plan. Measure out. Measure out if you've got this buff piece, how many models can I keep to be wholly within? Um, so if it's if it's a 12 inch bubble, can you actually put the thing at the 12 inch line? Because does this thing move the same speed as the thing that's at the 12 inch line? And if it doesn't, then you can't move as far forward, you know. So you have to be two inches in, and it's just little things like that when you start applying bubbles to it, you know, because just movement itself is something that people don't work on enough. And if, if you think you're going to do a three day tournament, you, you're only going to move those pieces 15 times, you know, it's three, it's three turns, five rounds each, you know, so you could do that practice within 20 minutes, you know, and figuring out how to move on 15. Of course, it's a lot more math when you have to figure out how to do it against an opponent, but you'll be 
better at it and faster at it if you just do it without an opponent there and you know how to do it. And that's that's the, you just don't want to make that take time. So. Yeah. So I guess that's the point that I wanted to make here is, is actually practice your deployment. What does quote unquote ideal deployment look like? And, you know, I'll use an example here of one of my armies and, you know, this is my daughters of Cain army. It's a, a witch elf build. Um, a couple of the key buffs that I want to call out here is the blood shield. So it's a plus one save aura from the cauldron. So I want to, even in turn one, if I'm a high drop army, I want to make sure that my army is getting as many buff, buffs as possible. And the high gladiatrix um, who gives the, the the minus one to rend, um, that's got a 12 inch bubble. So, you know, I want to keep those key pieces within the aura. This could be defensive bubbles. It could be magic bubbles, command bubbles, uh, regular abilities. You know, I think about those auras like, you know, what are those critical command abilities that I want to be able to apply? Uh, what are the allegiance abilities I want to be thinking about? Because the last thing you want to do is deploy outside your bubble uh, because you got too zealous and uh, excited in the deployment zone and you've you've missed a key piece. Well, and as you can see too, you you've also deployed, so you you're gonna go to the right a little bit with one of your bubbles, you know. And so you you kind of have, you already know where that bubble's at, so you know where those pieces that that bubble affects need to be as well. And so you you get to use your auras to build upon your deployment. And it layers, you know. And so, and the and, and daughters of Cain have the ability to run and charge with the witch elves. So I could and I wanted to show off that you know against flesh eater courts who wants also wants to charge me, my opponent. I, 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 they've got a lot of fast moving things like terror geists and zombie dragons. So I know that you know they could hit a, a, a charge really quickly. So I can give that three or four inch gap off the deployment line so that they're not hitting my critical pieces. But I'm also giving it a way to go. Well, look, I can run and charge. So, so that three to four inches, I'm not too worried about them. I can make up for it if I want to fight you back. Yeah, see, that's that run and charge. <laughs> but against my hurts. gloom spike gets, for, but my gloom spike gets, for example, if I was running, you know, in this particular example, I know they can't run and charge. So I need to think about well, if I give off, if I give away X amount of movement off the line, I know now that it's a a ten inch move to get onto an objective my gits move four or five so i'm gonna have to rely on a, a command point to guarantee myself on the objective or i'm chancing it and there's a good chance i'll fail so maybe i'm going to keep one of my cp up my sleeve just for a forward to victory yep just for that extra yeah and that's the the biggest thing about deployment and the thing we're getting on first is really even aura ranges isn't as important as knowing movement ranges and knowing where you're going to go and and for the first two turns where you're going to end up kind of thing because that's that's the opening going back to the idea of chess before you actually hit your opponent is like the opening the middle game is when you're starting to trade and then end game is when you have like nothing left and you're trying to figure out where everybody's at and so your opening is what you have to plan with deployment in in chess we are just you can just memorize all the old different openings and it all depends upon how people move their first pawns but in aos there's no set deployment so you really get to make your opening how you want and some armies can win the opening and the middle game just by getting on the board and and like holding the board and that that is a strategic way of winning the game it's just board control and you just don't die and that it, it's not my style but it's it is a style and that that that's where our first important thing of deployment is knowing your movements so that you can get there or not <laughs> and that's where it's important to know your movements before you deploy so it, before you try to deploy you need to practice your movements out so then you can get used to that flow that will help you with deployment um, and then we get into the the aura abilities, and this is what yeah. the the it's a weird aura to think of, but think of movement as its own aura is what I was kind of saying. So I might I might add one more thing to this because I think this is Bobby something I've missed is that this is a tournament. So obviously I had my tournament list, my opponent had his tournament list, and when we traded tournament lists, I could quickly see how many drops is my opponent. How many drops is my army? So I was a two drop in this particular list. My opponent was more than two. So I went into the I went into the deployment knowing that I was going to get to choose who went first and who went second. So on this picture, 
in this picture, in this example, obviously on here, right? Because, and you'll you'll probably think about, well, which elves probably want to be aggressive? Well, no, I wanted to give away first turn because I wanted to get more of my buffs before I went into my opponent. If I wanted to be aggressive, I would have put my witch elves on the line, probably would have put my uh, my cauldron on the line so that I could go in and, and turn one attack you. But I was holding back a little so that I could go into turn two and turn three and do more of my damage. So it, that's probably one thing we didn't talk about is like at that. least construction. No, no, no. At least construction. How many drops are you? Because if you are low drops, you're going to have an advantage of knowing who goes first, who goes second, and you can deploy conservatively, aggressively, and you have the advantage there. So I did want us to redeploy these questions in a way that made it so that it matters this way. Of course, that thing, though, who's going to go first, who's going to go second, is more important in, in when you go to choose to deploy. But before you can think of that, I think it's important to just know what you're deploying, your army itself. And so, yeah, in, in this specific example, I, when you said, oh, I knew how it was going to be, I was like, oh, okay, you probably gave him first turn because you're you're behind your line. <laughs> you're not trying to go into him. And so, um, and and that, that comes with you knowing that you your ranges for how far you're going to move and then to be able to get to him on the first turn you would have to be on the line so that's where you you deployed in a way where you and, and you the double turn we're going to cover it at the end because i i have an example and you have an example of it too and it's just i love it but some people don't but i think it's important to just have in the game and um it, before you worry about it though worry about what you're going to do so Gareth makes a good comment here as well. You know, the number of times I've set up thinking, well, I'd be, I better be prepared um, if I'm given first or if I'm given second. And what what's being said here is that, you know, you need to think about having a, if you're not one drop or two drop, you need to go into the de deployment um, believing that your opponent could give you either. So you can't be too aggressive. You can't be too conservative. You need to have something that would benefit both. Um, so so I don't like doing that. Just just as a side note, that's why I always took a one drop or or a low drop count because I liked being able to go into it knowing exactly how I'm going to deploy regardless of what my opponent was going to do because I was going to alpha most of the time. And and, and that was the thing too. So it, it it's different when you do that compared to then you – the only time I ever worried about it was when I lost the roll off against another one drop. And so um, – but – he, it's very important to have your have your things, and then we're gonna get into the army composition because we're we're still going into just war scroll composition right now. But when when you comp when you get into what the army you're you're taking does, you you can kind of think, okay, is my opponent gonna be aggressive or not? Should I be more defensive? Should I be more aggressive? You know, and, and that's what we're getting at here too. But first we need to just know our auras and you have the ability to make those bubbles go further and, and run in charge, but you still had to have your bubbles up high. You couldn't have them all the way in the back because you weren't trying to just control the board. You're still trying to get your bubbles up far enough to when your guys get into fight, they're still being affected by the bubbles. And that's different than a defensive army, which would still be a little cagey in back and not wanting to get hit by those pieces. And so you needed to find that, for your army, you know, and, and I just think that that's more important than trying to figure out who's going to go first, who's going to go second. Any, any of the other stuff is more. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. But I guess my point here was that when you know, if you're going first or second, because you have the lowest drops on the table, it allows you to determine the deployment. I get a more aggressive, more defensive. Uh, when you're not winning the deployment um, battle, then you need to think about how do I respond if I get given first? What happens if I get given second? And you need to be a bit more flexible. And here's an example here where we, we talk a little bit about as well, well, the differences between holy within and just within, and even just some of the base sizes, right? Like what, did, what do you want to add to this one? Well, I have a well, it's, drink. It's just, it's a vis it's so visual for you to see. So the, the little green dot in the middle is if you had like a one inch base, and what a 12 inch aura was. I, I rolled up to Old Town, uh, Old Town Throwdown 2, and I was playing with somebody who thought that their grave sites 
were like 12 inch bubbles. It, they're 24 inch bubbles, you know? So like that little circle, that little gray circle is what he thought he was able to revive in. And I'm like, bro, you're like, you're, you're, you're losing about six times as much. And so, yeah, exactly. That's, that's your map. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, artists don't copy, they create. Um, but the, but the, the thing is that when you look at, so the difference there is like, if, if I had a, uh, a necromancer you know who had an aura but i used to run soul blight and i loved being able to re-roll my charges so i would have a vizlod vampire lord on zombie dragon with the holy within 12 inches gets to re-roll their charge and i'd still take even an offensive death style which is not what you're supposed to but i'd drop three units of grave guard and try to charge if all three of them and um that bubble just the, the the size of that bubble those line the, the the squares are 15 inches apart you know so that red circle is 30 inches compared to 25 you know and so that's it, it, it's something you can do and i'll show later in the double turn picture but i use garrisons to also increase my aura bubble so that i have that same effect as you see right here with the green going to the red and you see the difference in size and and basically if you put yourself in that piece of terrain to the right or the left you're controlling three of the five objectives with that red circle not like you're already touching four of them right now with the red circle whereas you're only touching two of them with the green you know and so that's that whole idea of how much can you increase or decrease things by base sizes and why base sizes matter is weird <laughs> yeah no our rto does provide terrain maps like that and so that's what i was saying um but it, it's just yeah yeah and it, it would once you visualize it once you finally actually have just that visual i hope that and that's why i used red and green because i hope it burns into your eyes where you you really see that the, the bubbles are a lot bigger than people think they are and yeah the the, the bubble and, and that's probably where for example the corn demon prince catches you off because an 18 inch aura around the corn demon prince is almost like half the battlefield it's ridiculous bubble and i kind of tap into that for example in my daughters of cane with my my cauldron has the crown of woe that allows me to, um, is it the crown of woe? I've got uh, one artifact that allows me to do the, the rally, the four up rally, which is incredible um, within an aura. But then there's also, I can make you basically shut off inspiring presence and rally within nine. And if I kill a model, it turns to 15. And on a, on a, like a 32 mil base, it's all right. That's pretty average. But on like this massive, like what, a hundred, hundred or 70 odd, um, uh, oval base it's a very big footprint so look either way i think we've got the point there auras think about your auras think about when you're deploying thinking about what those key benefits and auras and things you want to think about the other one I'll, I'll throw out as well is make sure you're in unbind range the amount of times i've seen i've seen people not put a wizard in unbind range and then your opponent puts that critical spell off like That's i don't know thankful thankful in the boat <laughs> Uh, you you deny yourself a chance to deny. I mean, yeah, thankful near a null hole is plus four, but um, you know, make sure you've got a wizard in range to unbind. So think about it defensively as well as offensively. No, if you if you drew a thirty inch on that, it would be behind the top objective. From the red thing, it'd be like because it's twenty two inches to the objective. That's another six to right there, so that's twenty eight. So it'd be behind that gray line on the top. That would be your thirty inches. You know, and then, and I know that's weird to say it that way, but that's, that's how, I, so again, I know they're all 11 apart and then I know that the objectives have to be six from it. So I know that I got that 28 right there to that top, top line that the arrow is pointing to, you know, and that's 30 inches. And if you're out, if you're not in that range, you normally the opponent planned for that. So you can set up on the back line because as you see, it'd be two inches above that top line. So you would have, I think like three inch, if you're behind the four inch line, you can keep yourself in, on this map out of unbind range, you know, and that's, that's an aura to think of, you know? And so if, if you want to not, if you want to make sure a, a spell goes off on this map, stay behind the four inch line, there's no way they can get, unless there's a redeploy wizard, but like, it, there's no way they can get in range, <laughs> which there is, but still, but that's a different thing. But 
it, that that aura though you you think of when you set up your list you're like okay so if i want to make sure that this spell goes off i have to have this wizard at the 3.9 range you know because then i there's no way they can try to unbind it and that that's where you start your castle off and then you build your auras off from there so 100 percent, and that's kind of why i showed off in the last slide just showing off the gap between the deployment zone versus where my army was because sometimes it's better off actually not being as aggressive with let's say that wizard but actually by being out of unbind range so you can get that critical spell off um sacrifice the arcane terrain yeah you might want to deploy on an arcane terrain but it's actually better off maybe and you know you could obviously a plus one will give you a better chance but actually an even better but, but, chance would be crow. completely yeah or or a better chance would be actually being completely out of unbind range and your opponent has no chance so i would i would say statistically being out, out of unbind range gives you about a 50 percent better chance than being next to arcane at least unless you unless you get against like seraphon who just like board wide just like flat out deny you but w when you're thinking about yet yeah, those deployments there's a there's a lot to consider here. I might throw this one over to you while I I, I quickly choke and, and have a drink. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna do that next. But this was the one that I came up with with within Power of Poirs, and we kind of went to it, and that's where I was like, oh, I I wish we kind of had this screen a little earlier because I, everybody understands the idea of rock paper scissors or, or Rochambeau, and I like to use that to kind of generalize the army. So you want to generalize things to give yourself a general idea. Um, and that, that's how I've won. I've only played about 130 games total in, in, in everything. And, and I always make these general analogies. And then I'll learn because of the general analogies from a specific. And that's, I try to remember those. But in this picture, we have my raptors and my birds that have won me many games in the top left corner. And they need screens. They're shooting. They have a 30-inch range if they don't move. Um, and then below them, and I consider them the scissors, and below them I have my fulminators and then a unit of crossbowmen. And then what I consider them is the ones that hate screens because they need those crossbowmen to kind of clear out the screen so that the fulminators can get to where they want to go. And then to the right of them is what I'm taking currently, which is a bunch of blade guys, um, where they are the screen. Um, so a uh, little tidbit that I threw in there, if you want to maximize screen distance, you put little triangles on the end and then you go one inch apart between each model so that you have a, a much wider range of screening distance that you make. Um, and, and again, I, I put it into rock, paper, scissors <laughs> uh, because I do consider board control um flooding the board with multiple bodies and there's many armies that do that gets is is one of them uh corn with mortals do that kind of thing um and night haunt soul blight um you can even try to flood the board with stormcast now you can take a ton of vindictors you can take a bunch of liberators there was a weird build back in 2.0 with the Stormkeep thing where you could take 60 liberators and just just flood the board you know so that's that's a board control army um and that's different than and they they are their own screens they're just there to die but if they don't die they win because they stay alive whereas your rock type armies which i consider piggies and, and maw crushers one of the, the prime examples of these get in they hit hard and they they stay pretty well they don't stay great but they they stay well enough or they normally kill the thing before they have to worry about staying and then you have things that castle up and hide behind things and they they want to do their damage from a distance they do more damage than most stuff but because they do more damage they take more damage and they they have to have something defend them because of it and so that's you know that's that's how i see the balance of each in and, and, and that's what i was like in each army <laughs> um the my little setup uh the the you have each of these pieces. So my difference between Gavin's list is that I had 500 pieces of a paper, you know, of, 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 I call it paper, but it was actually like a tanky board control. I had Phoenix guard, you know, and I like to take two units of Phoenix guard and a, and a, and a Phoenix. And so they're, they're battle shock immune and they hold this piece of the board for me while I did everything else with my fulminators. Whereas he had just a bunch of shooting and there was no, so you can have an army that has each piece of this in it is what I'm trying to get at. And, and 
you want to define the pieces of your army as what they are in re in relationship to being a screen is kind of the easiest way to start and then build from there um because yeah. then you then you kind of have your, your movement ranges and stuff like that like we were talking about with deployment so uh, there's, there's a few other things that i'd add to that first off in the current season if you're listening to this general handbook 2022 season one um your galician veterans are going to take up two damage a piece right if they are battle line so i would think about your screens in regards to um if if they are gvs and how long they will they will last as a, a screen the second part i would add to that is just having precise measurements on your screens right so when I look at, for example, protecting, uh, let, let's say it's the birds with the long strikes there. I don't know exactly what the distance is there, but if I was, if it's like two inches, right? If I got there's, there's three two, it's two threes. Yeah, what I was going to say was that um, sometimes we use screens, but we actually have them like basically just like base to base to the models they're trying to protect. Often you want to measure like one or two inches because between the two inch gap between um, the, let's say the shooting uh, unit that you want to protect, there's a two inch gap. Then there's model base. You can keep out those threat pieces that might have a three inch model or you might go three inch attack or the pile in, right? Cause you've got to factor in the pile in. So, um, so when you're, when you're screening, be very deliberate with the measurements as well to ensure that they just don't, shoot off part of the screen or do a monstrous rampage and stomp and do some mortal wounds on the screen and then use the pile in and those two or three inch attacks to eventually get into the unit you're trying to protect well that's how that was kind of the point tom tom wins a lot of his good games he he doesn't need to charge people if he just runs up and smacks you with bloodthirst <laughs> so, the six inch pile in is just it's one of those other things like you it's a piece of a movement in a place that you're not used to that makes it where that's why I have those two layers of screens for the Raptors there because you, you have to hit the first one and then I, I can and I'll redeploy forward, you know, so I get even more distance between my thing. I'm trying to I'll, I'll redeploy forward with my screens a lot of the time. So I want to make another comment and then that is that screens don't have to be cheap battle line. Um, I think a lot of people think about screens as just oh, like you know a, a, a minimum size unit of ten idiots. Actually, a monster hero could be a perfect screen, right? Because especially in some of the battle plans where you get extra points for uh, scoring with, scoring with a GV, or if the GV dies, then you're giving away free battle tactics. So you might want to give away I don't know some cavalry units. Maybe if you've got like a monster hero that can absorb damage, maybe they're a better screen than the ten idiots. Because you'll need those idiots to score objectives. Well, there's so, and this is why I was trying to say think of aggressive or defensive because the difference between a screen and what you're saying is it's a pinning piece. So there's there's screens and then there's pinning pieces and that like pinks used to be that you know because they they were your screen but because there were just so many bodies they just pinned this piece of the board and that's why I say board control because screen you want to think they're going to die but but a pin pinning screen or a tanky screen will will stay there and and create control of that piece and that's it, if you make your opponent not be able to move you've already won the first thing that we were talking about in the deployment you know so yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to add here? I think it's a great way to, again, to start thinking about your army, thinking about what you want to do. If you're a uh, an aggressive army, let's say the Forminators, Piggies, your Terror Geists, you're something that wants to run up the board and get in quickly. The last thing you want to be doing is dealing with screens, right? So you want to be able to shoot them off or get rid of them somehow so that your buffed up attacks get into the, get into the juicy targets. So thinking about how you navigate those screens, maybe... Um, charging into the corner of the screen to then pile into something else. Um, and that also obviously comes down to de deployment and where you deploy to, to do that. Well, that's, that's what I wanted people just, like I said earlier, I want people to have about 300 points of their army that they either can send, consider a pinning screen. So they make a tanky piece. That's going to go up somewhere. Chariots are a good example of this too. The 12 wounds floor up save, you know, they're just, you can pin people in places and they move really well. You know, I use hex rates for the same reason. They 24 inch move when they do this stuff. So it's, 
if you want to pin the person with your screen or if you want to have a screen, but have a part of your army that is there to either die because it sticks your opponent somewhere or keeps you your guys safe for longer. And it's just important. So it's the trade. It's the trade of a hundred points of worth of idiots who die in order to protect your good stuff, your hero, your monster. Well, your... Even, so people and that, that uh, to harp on that point a little bit, people think that they have to trade per model. So they think, Oh, I, I lost a hundred point model to them losing a 300 point model. But also think of it. Like if you take a piece that it doesn't matter if it's hundred points, how many points it is. If you stop them from scoring an objective for a turn, because you've put them in their backfield. It doesn't matter how many points the, the model is worth, it did its job, you know? And so that's um, the the idea there, you know? So, um, and then, yeah, then no. when you get into knowing what those people are, then you can get, I knew that was going to happen next. I wanted those up in the sh shot, but here we go. We're going to go this way. All right. Um, but when you, when you build your army, you build it around either staying in your own side or going into your opponent's side. And that's that's the idea of this, where it's the castle versus the Death Star. Like, either you're going to move and you're going to go into your opponent with these buff and these auras, like your your Doc Army does, that you just love to murder stuff with your blades. and Or you're like, okay, I want this portion of the map, and I'm going to kill him off from this portion of the map by shooting at him kind of thing. And that's that's not war school dependent that's how all of the pieces the three different pieces are supposed to work together you know and so that's what you want to think of when you're doing deployment after you do the deployment per thing you want to go into the bigger whole list idea yeah so yeah and and, and this is why there's no silver bullet to, to deployment right because there are so many different builds you've got uh, ultra aggressive combat ones you've got ones that want to base around movement hordes you've got magic armies you've got combat armies you've got high movement you've got a half armies that can deploy off the side of the board there are so many different play styles and then when they're on the table you know sylvaneth are a, a great little castle piece but they can also be built really offensively there are so many different ways to build your army i guess the key here is what's the characteristics that you want to build around and then how does deployment come in and allow you to demonstrate that on the table so um and just for anyone who might not know the terminology do you want to just give a high level what's the difference between let's say a castle and a death star like what, what are these terms so I mean, I, I went into the, the idea that the castle is going to – I didn't go into the idea of uh, the art of the game. So the art of the game is when you watch how all the pieces move. Like if you slow-timed, just like t took a – or fast-timed a video of like how we play and then you just watch how you move your pieces around, you're either going to see two things. You're going to see two armies smash into each other and then kind of splinter off or you're going to see them dance around each other. And it depends on the archetype of whether they're a castle or if they're a Death Star. So if it's two Death Stars, they're going to smash right into each other. If they're a castle and a Death Star, they're going to do kind of a dance. If they're two castles, you're going to see them both on, on the other side. They're not even going to really hit each other. And it's it's the idea that do you want to go forward or do you want to hold? And And can you do your damage from range or do you need to get into the opponent's face to do it and it's that's not really fair to a death star because death stars can be somewhat ranged death stars you don't really have that but they, they have the aura aspect of them to where you have to still be within range of the auras for that death star so that's why it's a death star instead of just a death who's, line. Who, so who's who's a death star would you say let's say iron jaws or sons for example sons of behemoth who just want to run up the board smash would you say that they no. are uh, so that's that's what i was trying to get at because it's it's death stars are dependent on the idea that you need the aura so you still need to be a bubble so like and that's what i was just saying like if if it's um red rover red rover then you can think of iron jaws and stuff like that where they don't they don't need the auras as much um they need the war chanters to put the buff on and so they can go forward, but they just get in your face and they push forward, you know? And so I think that's the, I think that's the difference between the three is there's, there's a castle, which is, it's going to hold and stay in that position and try not to really, it can't move forward. It shoots or it does range damage. And then a death star is, is, is like doc where you get all these extra bonuses, you get all these buffs and then you murder what's in your area 
you know, and then that, the last that's that's what I was trying to that's, that's what I was trying to get I was trying to get a practical example out of you. Thank you. So a perfect example of let's say a castle might be your traditional lumineth build, which has your sentinels and your wardens. The wardens are protecting the sentinels. They're gonna pew pew you, and they just kind of you know be a real defensive piece. The alternative is what you just said, like the play style of, let's say, the Daughters of Cain, where you either have the Witch Elves and the High Gladiatrix, you have um, the Snake Mama with all the combat snakes. They're the kind of, like, that's more of a death style. So they're just two examples of, of, it, of it, what it might look like. Both of those have the weakness in the sense that there is the Mole Rat size hole. I can't remember what it is from Star Wars. But the, the Wombat, or whatever it is, size hole, in each of them, either they have buffing pieces, you know, for the castles or for the Death Stars. And the, that's the difference, I would say, between Iron Jaws or certain just smash your face kind of armies because they don't necessarily need those buffing pieces and they don't need to stay in range. They just kind of, and that's the third of the play styles is in your face and smash. <laughs> so. I, I was just trying, I was just trying to bait an example out of you. That's all I wanted. Oh, I'm sorry. You just, that's all I that's fine. Like I was just baiting you. I was just trying to get the example out. Oh, because um, you're like, I play Doc, I love him. No, no, I just I was just trying to bait something out of you. But like speaking of Doc, he's an example of where we talked about the battlefield layout, right? And I think we we talked about that right at the start. This is a bit more, you know, less terrain, it's more ter uh, tournament optimized. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit about like the the flow of the battlefields. And here's an example of, of a game that I had recently where I had fire, fire slayers versus my daughters. And you can kind of see on the tabletop that you can see where the battle's going to take place. I've got the fire slayers coming in from the side. Wait. Go on. The, the, coming, the fire slayers are coming in from both corners, right? Because it's heaps of terrain and the, um, the magma forge, it's kind of blocking up the center. It's not really optimal for them. But I see that they have their buff pieces and their auras on that right side, you know, so they only have two units of small guys on the left side. There might be a hero right there, but on the right side, it's heavy, you know, and so I see it like that's what I see. So, yeah. And so just to give you some examples, like uh, I, I, I gave away first turn, so I wanted the fire slayers to walk up the board. But I knew that, you know, because they don't have a lot of flying units as well, it all had to happen really in the center of the board. And it was kind of being compressed. And even like to the flanks, it would like, take them a long time to get there or their base sizes might prohibit them from getting in. So I was able to use the the flow of the battlefield to be able to manipulate, especially because I've got Marathi down there, the flyer, um, who can use the, the the battlefield layout better. So I guess kind of what I want to share with you here is that um, looking at how the terrain is is um, is set up, as well as the flow and where the combats might happen, can help you prepare better, as well as choose the side of the table and why I gave away arcane terrain in order to get a better side of the board for the layout. Oh, okay. So you gave him the other side. What was what was arcane? Oh, I can't remember. Like, like I, I think I gave. I'm pretty sure I gave it away. I think. Um, but like when I look at that, for example, yeah, I can't remember what. Look, but you, but you gave point. away that side to get the correct the, to where he had to come and you had cover on your side a little bit more, or he had to come to you, kind of thing. Yeah, because like if you look at the the bottom right hand corner, for example, for him to go into that bottom left objective, sorry. That's an absolute pain in the backside for him to get to, right? Because one, he's trying to navigate through terrain. Two, he's got to like move and wheel around to kind of get to that piece. Um, and like really, like essentially, because those magma droths are on such big bases too, it's easy to clog up the board and clog up the center, and the other units can't kind of can't get in. So that's so, the thinking yeah. there. Yeah. So you made a funnel, like you you. you... <laughs> that's, it's on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously against a different opponent, it's a different thing. But I, I just kind of wanted to show you, you know, where terrain placement, um, mystical arcane dam sinister, how a battlefield is set up could determine and change your deployment. Um, you know, if I was playing a different army or a different terrain layout, maybe I'm spread out more. Maybe I'm compressed more. Maybe okay. I've got multiple waves. We, we know that these are both melee armies. I mean, we're going to go into a little highbrow here, but we both know that you guys both have to fight it out. So you weren't worried about shooting in this. Uh, like you're not taking bow snakes too, right? Like, yeah. So so then that's that's where w when you're saying, oh, I knew I had a funnel, it's it's more that you knew we, we had to fight. And because we have to fight, I get to choose where we're going to fight, you know? And if it, you were facing a shooting army, 
you would you would have done this differently because you it, it might have been more advantage to have more of the line of sight blocking terrain compared to a funnel is, is the idea but the funnel correct concept with melee versus melee you always want to kind of pick if you can your lane based off of the terrain and terrain is super important because it blocks their big pieces from getting to where they want to be so correct and Stormcast, for example, like or Nighthaunt or anyone who comes in from reserve, that could then change the way you deploy and where you put things down and where the flow of the battle is because then the signs of the storm is going to pick those weak points that they want to fight. So, you know, how do you castle up or how do you prepare or add those screens in order to stop Stormcast coming into your good stuff? I, I've lost a game of Soul Blight because as you know, the throw out to Sam, um, I was completely zoned out. So I, I couldn't drop anything in because he, he knew how to zone out my grave sites and he had enough uh, green skins to just do it. And so he did it. And all I had was what I had deployed with, which I deployed all my, like I said, I deployed all my grave guard off. And the so I didn't have anything to hit him with in my turn. So my, my turn one was nothing because using the terrain and using how to deal with the grave sites, you can just zone your opponent out with the pieces that are on the board. Cause they have to physically put them down. <laughs> they have mm. to land somewhere. Which also comes into play with, say, Sylvaneth, who's the, there's a rise of Sylvaneth right now. So if I'm a Sylvaneth player and I'm looking at the battlefield, where is the optimum place to put down trees? And can you start giving your opponent a bad side of the board? Or do I want to take up first so I move up the board to stop more trees from spawning on the table? So, again, a lot of variables that come into play when it comes to battlefield layout. And yeah, yeah. now that Sylvaneth is more popular, I think it's an important thing to consider. With anything that has to kind of move with teleports like Scions and Night Hunt, anything that has to summon, using terrain is is its own funnel and its own... Uh, Kyle, another shout I got to give, he's always told me, because he plays a lot of KO, he's like... Consider the trains as enemy models too, to me. So I, because I can't land on them, I can't land next to them. I have to be outside of an inch. So it's, you, it's a different board when you start looking at it as little bubbles of not land zone. So, yeah, no, great, great, another great addition to thinking about the battlefield a little differently, um, which kind of leads to well, like the battlefield always changes a lot. Um, there are so many different deployment zones available to us. And there are so many either different measurements on the gap between us. You can see here the top left-hand corner, there's a 22-inch gap between us if we both deploy on the line versus the second, that the, the, the top middle is a 30-inch gap. Um, there are so many different variables that you need to adapt to. Um, I'll throw it up to you first. How do you think about the deployment zones and how it influences deployment? Well, I... You sent me this image and then I edited this image to add all the little lines into it because that's how I, I look at it. And I love how you just were like, okay, this is what you can automatically see from it. Um, what I was trying to do with the stars was to try to give you an idea of what objective you would want to go to um, after that. What do, you, what do you think of the last three images too, after, before I go? And then um, I would tell you what I was trying to convey with this basically because there's two big points I want to make on this slide, basically. Uh, I'm not, what, what, what do you mean by that question? So with the the bottom left thing where I have the 13.5, that's actually wrong. It's supposed to be 12.7. But um, that's that's good old A squared, B squared equals C squared math. And that's, that's good math right there. Um, where you're 12.7 inches away. And it's just one of those things where you don't think about it until you see it. And then um, the the dad joke is it's it's easier to get up than it is to get in. And it, the idea is for the next slide where you're, you're only 11 inches to go up or down, whereas it's 15 inches to go across. So you're always gonna wanna go towards the thing that's gonna be four inches further for your opponent to get to, you know? And that that piece of tactic is just, just dependent upon that map itself. And so each map has its own tactics, not dependent of themselves without anything to do with your army. You know, they, they have their own tactics and you should kind of look at those too, depending upon the deployment zones and depending upon the, the thing. So I just, my major two points was that there's, there's some tricky ones where you're in that corner and 
you're able to, if you're both on the line, be within 12 inches of your opponent is the one thing I wanted to make sure from this slide. And then the other thing was that you always want to kind of go up if you can, instead of trying to go over. So, yeah, there's a lot of things you could break down here. I think, um, like, for example, your top right corner, the uh, Realm State Cache, I think it's, it's the battle plan for that particular one. If I was a Skaven player, I could put my two Nar holes into my opponent's deployment zone and block up even more of that space. So first off, it's already a smaller deployment zone compared to the others. But then if I've got a, a faction terrain piece that could be put into my opponent's side, then I could reduce, I could restrict that space even further. Um, and if they have a terrain feature, let's say it's like OBR and they've got like the Nexus, then all of a sudden it's not. my opponent, but my opponent might not put down the Nexus or <laughs> it means that maybe some of their army can't be deployed, which essentially means they're killed. So um, you can really think about them a little bit differently. But I guess the key that I want to share with you here is thinking about the, me we've talked a lot about measurements. We've talked about pre-measuring, understanding your army, how fast it moves, the combination is a run, move, run, charge and move and teleports and all the things you've got in front of you. But think about them in, in relation to the battlefield and how fast you're going to be and, and, and deploying one on the line and how many objectives you can score early. Um, there's so many variables that you need to factor in. And again, why you don't want to have one set way to deploy yeah so the bottom two left ones are i tried to split the maps into four categories or into three groups of four there's three of them that you're within 12 inches if you both deploy on the line and they're like the bottom two left ones and then there's three of them that you're a, a full 18 apart and then you're above 22 apart you know and so if you're an aggressive army and you want to get into your opponent you're going to love the four that are 12 inches apart and vice versa if you're not an aggressive army you're gonna love that 30 inch one because you're like oh i get to play my game and set up and then i get to i don't have to worry about them being in my face turn one and so you when you've built your army and you've kind of started working through the oars and started working through the stuff then you can kind of still sandbox your army into the deployment zones and say oh i like this one or i don't like this one because of yada yada and it, it helps you define more of what your army is which helps you just in, intuitively deploy them um, is what I was trying to get with, with the visuals. Yeah. So no, that's great. No, it's great. And, and it, it, a lot of variables come into play. Like if I, if I'm a shooting based army and I'm in the top left-hand corner and there's a 22 inch gap between us and I want to avoid that shooting, then I just don't deploy on the line or my good stuff is not on the line. Or if I'm a combat army and I'm relying on charging and I want to get in turn one and um, maybe I need to find some spells, some abilities, some uh, uh, endless spells, anything that can increase the charge distance for some of those ones with a larger deployment gap compared to some of the others, right? So you can think about these very offensively but also defensively. Um, so it's probably the key you, that I want to share here. You brought up Tom Guan. So I got really lucky at, at SD Open because I baited him, he was taking Doc shooting Doc to try to kill my dragon turn one. He outdropped me. And so it was that idea where I knew where I had to deploy to let him shoot me. And I knew how to not let him shoot me. And I deployed deliberately to where he could only shoot me with half of his line, but he'd still get to get shoot me again. So I, I w was still gonna probably die, but if I survived, I had the good chance for the double and I had a good chance to actually be in a good position. So I, I did that bait as a way of, and I got really lucky, but it's, it, it's that idea where you use that measurement later on, knowing what your opponent's trying to look for too, to your advantage. And you can use it as bait in certain areas. So. And it and, and might be worthwhile calling out here, you know, not everybody knows every little build and how things work in the game, especially yeah, newer or more inexperienced players. But having a conversation up front and say, well, you know, how far can you shoot? You know, how many spells can you cast? Uh, how fast can you, can you, can you run and charge? Can you teleport? Well, they'll say it's 24 inches. But, but having that. And then you can kind of, I was just going to say, then you can kind of do the whole back and forth with them of, okay, well, I'll put him halfway there. So you didn't have to know it. You could still you can still bait. It's dangerous because you don't know how much damage the thing's going to do. So, but you could still bait the, your opponent to learn what they do, kind of thing yeah. too. So, 
Yeah, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, you don't need to know everything about every little build in the army. Have that conversation up front and help, it helps make that deployment decisions a little easier. Um, but yeah, 100%, 100%. And, you know, it then kind of maths out. And here's an example of one of mine is that, you know, there was a, an 18 inch gap between us. I know that my mega gargant, my gate breaker moves 12, which means it's six inch charge. Um, you know, my opponent could do a redeploy. Is it worth it? Does a, a six inch charge going up to, let's say a nine or a 10, is it worth the CP question mark? Um, but you can really start to use the maths to understand probability and expectation so that I don't need to use a run roll in order to secure the objective. I know that, you know, with a certain movement, I'm going to be in range for shooting that can go into X targets and priorities. It's about using maths and probability. Um, spoiler alert, Krondus got a Bella cord. So Krondus had to sit back a little, not Krondus, Kron Spine had to sit back a little bit, the jerk. Um, but it, it's about maths and understanding the probability and expectation is probably the point that I wanted to think about when it comes to distances. It's about the distance between you and your opponent if you both deploy on the line. It's about what happens if my opponent doesn't deploy on the line. And that often can those, be a good The last decision. slide was all if you were on the line. Yep. And that was that was the thing too. That was all if they were on the line from the last slide. It, those are just those measurements, but you change that, and 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 that's where you 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 do that because you try to avoid a, a six inch charge with a reroll is almost assured. It's like a 75, 80 percent chance. Whereas a seven eight inch charge goes down. You know, an eight inch charge is like a with a reroll. It's like only like a fifty five or something like that. It's not as high. You know, and it's just just knowing yeah. that did did you kill a bird was it <laughs> were one of those birds done after you were uh the 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 um yeah i mean uh there was, there was a bunch i can't remember how what happened um there was a redeploy i think uh, the, i think the bluebird redeployed i went into i think it was bellacore or maybe i went into something i can't remember but um the the, the oh, i think i gave away first oh i can't remember i, I really don't remember this game um, but some birds did die, but I think it was a cron spy, the cron spy who, who ate most of the birds, which was a nice power up, but yeah, anyway, you know, being in range of unbinds, being in range for casting, being in range, what happens to forward to victory, even redeploy as well. And how that kind of changes, um, the distances and between you. The idea too is not just how distant you are from your opponent; it's also from your objectives. And 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 on the last slide too, that's why I had the arrows to where I would go to the objectives because this is distance between you and your opponent. But like I had earlier, you're either ten inches to an objective or you're fifteen. You know, and not a lot of things can't move even more than six inches. So you you really have to try to get to that objective and. Um, that's your next thing, you know, and you want to, you want to control a, like half of the board. You don't ever want to control the whole board is, is the big trick that people think they need to do. Um, so. No. And the game plan in this particular photo was to score the left side and the middle objective. And if I did enough damage and I controlled it enough, then I can move to the right-hand side and claim that objective. Because trying to claim multiple objectives, all I need to do is one, two, and more. And two out of three is more. So um, I don't need to stretch myself too far to get three objectives. But you're right. If this was, again, my Gloom Spike Gits, who are base mover five, it's fundamentally a very different movement to get onto the objective, let alone to charge. So this ultimately changes the way um, I look at deployment, but either way, look, it's about being in range of unbinding or being in, out of range. Try to try to deploy your wizard uh, at, so they don't get unbound of, of a critical spell. Um, quick question from Zach is how many cron spines do you think we're going to see at Old Town Throwdown? Four. It's a super chat. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to bring that one up. It's a super chat. All right. We've got four, four coming no, up. I, Old Town Throwdown. I say four, I think. All right. You come to Old Town oh, Throwdown. Bring, bring, everyone brings a cron spine. Everyone bring a cron spine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I, I told you at the start of the show that I'd show you one of the examples that I made a horrible, horrible mistake. And there's this one here. I was up against a Stormcaster Turtles player, had a couple of dragons on the table. You had the, the Lord Imperitant and you had Krondus, which was great. I'm like, cool. Oh. Like, kind of math, 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 Mathematically, I know what's going to go here. Um, I can't remember if this was pre or post the change of the um, the hero phase move. But either way, like, I'm like, right, I, I know the dragons. One's going to go this way. One's going to go this way. I know Krondus is going to go a center of the board. I kind of know the feel. I'm like, right. Um, and, I, and this was... It looks like it was uh, before they nerfed it because you look like you were behind the 24 even with a good charge distance. So it was like you're past seven. You're like 31 inches away is what it looks like. Correct. Correct. So I was I was mapping that out and in my mathematics uh, at deployment, I'm like, okay, cool. I just need a nine-inch barrier and I'm good because he had unit of three annihilators. And I forgot to ask the question and I forgot to ask because everything that comes in from reserve is nine inches, everything. And what happened was I left my, um, my uh, sexy little hag queen um, on cauldron of blood with a nine inch barrier, but not a seven inch barrier and annihilators with a Lord Imperitance on the table could do an, a seven inch charge. Sorry, sorry, seven inch deployment. So what happened was I left a little flank open. Uh, my cauldron being a critical piece in this particular army got charged. Uh, and that was all she wrote for that cauldron. And then I was like scrambling and then the dragons hit me in the face. So I ended up losing that game. But if I remembered or had asked the question about the annihilators coming from reserve, I may have screened them a little bit better and the outcome might have changed. So I guess that's kind of why screening and thinking about zones and areas and measuring things out can be really critical. To, to touch on that point is the idea of when I was taking fulminators from reserve, it's nine inches. Yep. Yep. Go on. Uh, yeah, I know four is going to do what I, I guess. I don't know. Cause there's so many purple suns. I could assume there'd be more, but that'd be the only reason. Um, so w with fulminators, fulminators have about a two inch, and then three and a half, they're, they're a big base. They're not a small, they're a calf base. And you're going to come in a unit of two or four. So it's not nine inch barrier that you have to, to zone out. It's a, a 10 and a half inch, 11 inch barrier, you know? And, and you, when you go into the opening with your opponent or you go into the talking to them about how their units work, if they tell you, Hey, I have certain units that I can just deploy from deep strike. Like you, it's a seven inch barrier. Yes. But technically, cause it's three little guys, it's a eight. Well, the corners are funny their own self, but if it was a flat line, you could technically be at eight, you know, or, or seven and a half cause it's 32 bases or 7.1. And, and you get that extra one inch closer towards the objectives in the other end. So you don't have to fully zone out with fulminators. You could be easily at, you have like a 10 inch barrier because they, they can't fit on the board edge. So you want, you yeah, want to factor that in just like earlier with the picture of the auras and how the little green one wasn't the same as the, the, the big red one. You want to factor in that base size when you're also counting how much you have to screen out the edges. And so if they say I'm trying to drop in a Lariel, which they can't do, but if they're trying to drop something from the edge, that's huge. You know, you, you won't, have to screen as much and so um that's just another little piece to add to that you want to add the base size to their distance so if they're a two inch base it's a nine inch distance they have to be so you have to screen 11 inches and the other consideration as well is on the table you're seeing um nine inch gauges you're seeing like combat gauges get a bunch of accessories that helps you screen helps you screen and see if you're trying to zone out someone nine inches, you're trying to um, avoid a pile in or a charge. You're trying to look at, you know, ways to, to layer those screens to make sure that someone who hits you, your screen can't attack over into your, your good units. Um, get yourself some sixes, some nine inches, your three inches. I sell them. You can sell them on, find them on Etsy and a whole bunch of, of places, but um you can see $3 like, got, like a piece of stick that you cut and you just you can make 10 of them from from the little sticks from hobby lobby kind of thing it's i love sticks because you can roll them when you're trying to figure out your aura and such like that on the thing but 
they're just so helpful to have. I, I made little seven inches too when I used to run the Imperitant, just just for that. And guess what? Somebody out to Old Town Throwdowns getting some some of my combat gauge accessories, so they're coming as well. So, but get get yourself some accessories. I think that helps you plan out. You'll see, like I've got like seven of them on the table, and then I, there was a whole bunch more from this photo, just from me measuring out distances and and things like that. Um, but a lot of this as well is is about adapting to your opponent um you can see here this is an image supplied not by the gareth in the chat a different gareth um uk gareth you know you can see here that this particular Ardneth deepkin army was up against iron jaws the iron jaws was a very uh, aggressive build they were concerned about being charged so what what they did was they have cast it up around the um the uh gloom type shipwreck which gives them i believe is it namadi five a five plus ward they i think so memory uh, five what board yeah 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 for the for the thralls and the reavers so you can see here that you know that they've become a a screen they're going to eat up you've got the uh the reavers who are going to unleash hell and and try to shoot off anyone that kind of charges into them he's protecting his eels and his turtles as well so they could kind of go in and respond but well, so you know the, the screen range that you were talking about earlier, he didn't, there's no range between his things and the screens because the thing behind it can hit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and against a, a different opponent, if this was Lumineth, if it was against Stormcast, if it was against any other army, um, this strategy may not be applied. It's just that in an aggressive build, this opponent has, a, so this player has adapted to his opponent. Well, you and I know that Iron Jaws is going to be able to move all the way across the board and be right right on those objectives, even though it doesn't look like they should be able to. And that's that's kind of the thing that he knew, too. So he's like, OK, I'm just going to be back here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else that you would add here or, or you know, you, you would recommend when it comes to like adapting to your opponent? I mean, it's 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 the same. It Once you know what you always want to kind of make that three way with the rock, paper, scissors, you want to make general concepts. And once you know what your general concept is, then you can try to general concept your opponent and adapt to that. So if you're facing a mirror match, you know, and you know that paper is weak to scissors, you're going to be more like scissors, you know, and, and if you're both paper and that it's, it's a weird thing to say, but if you have a, a scissors unit in your paper and your opponent is paper, but they don't have a scissors unit, you're going to try to keep your scissors unit alive for longer. You know, that's, that's the kind of idea behind generalizing your army first so that when you come to the table, because like a perfect example, and then we're going to go into how I faced this guy before in IDK. I'm playing Night Hunt right now. You don't normally have your turtle up in the front because you want to have the aura buffs and such, but because it does so much damage, it destroys Night Hunt. And it's better to have in the front. And so that's one of those adapting to your army kind of situations where a piece that does one thing can also do another depending upon what it's facing. If if and that's why you want to define it as paper, rock, or scissors, because if it's a paper piece, it's gonna have a good time against rock and that's where it gets hard because it takes experience takes time to get to defining it that way um that's why you want to just do it for your pieces first you know and then that's why i play multiple armies and, and such like that so you can start to really define it for your pieces then once you've defined it for your pieces then you can see that's how all the good players do it. they play all tons of different armies so know your army first then worry about your opponent second and you learn those those mistakes over time and you know you're like oh if, if i did this differently you know the game might adapt um but ultimately yeah thinking about thinking about the style and think about the battle plan as well think about how you score your battle tactics and you score on the mission because in each of those will vary on what is worth trading what could be a good screen and you know the last thing you want to do, for example, if this one this was a battle plan that gave away extra victory points for losing um, GVs, or it was a, a battle plan that only scored using Gladian veterans, then keeping those thralls and reavers alive are critical. Otherwise, you can't score. So there's there's two ways to adapt to an opponent. One, you can either try to figure out what their weakness is and if you can affect it. And two, it's if they're uh, if their strategy is going to hurt yours and how to affect that, you know? And so you, just like how you always are going to look for the weak point, you also want to look into the, 
like if you can deny them getting battle tactics or if you can deny their ability to do stuff because even though you normally wouldn't throw those reapers up or you wouldn't normally do this kind of thing you you do that in this scenario because their army can't doesn't have the movement you have or does you know and so that's that's where the adapting to the army comes into place and that's why you want to have you don't want to think of your list as one single thing you want to have pieces in your list that can do things so that when you come to that army you have that thing that you do for that army and it it just comes with practice so and a, and a great example of this before we kind of segue through is um i remember when nagash was really powerful the height of nagash you know especially i think it was like petrifix elite nagash right you know two up armor save six up ward absolute monster yes nagash has changed a little bit right but at the height of nagash he was an unstoppable force and you couldn't kill nagash. it's just ridiculous <laughs> and i remember the time where i said to some people just don't kill him just ignore nagash he's one model kill everything else. Arcane was you, like you, that too, but yes. Ar Arcane is exactly the same, right? And adapting to your opponent is like, well, cool, for me to win the battle plan, if I kill those skeletons or those, you know, um, Mortec guard, Nagash is one model. Nagash can only be on one. He, 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 can, he can only be on one objective, so as long as I keep scoring, I'm adapting to my opponent, but if, it's, if there's no Nagash, then that's a very different, that's not a strategy I would use. There's two things to that too, and this is the, we we kind of were touching on it earlier. There's adapting to your opponent's list, and then there's adapting to your opponent because that's that's two things too. And and there's a psychological aspect to the game where like to be a good player when I know that the person doesn't know what I know, and I know that it's gonna make the game just just put them in a bad place because they don't know that thing. I will try to teach them or tell them if they're a nice person, I'll just flat out tell them if they're kind of a jerk, I'll, I'll try to edge them in that way. But I will always try to make it so that I don't win because of a mistake too early. You know, I want to win because of a mistake my opponent made, but I don't want to do it right off the bat in deployment. And that's why I always try to make that be a very fair and open in game. And that's different than just looking at the lists because you can look at the lists and see the list and what they're going to do. And you, you can start defining lists as what their pieces do, what their power pairs do, and then you see their bubbles of their power pairs and how they work. And that's that's different than adapting to if you have to face Gavin, you know, which I didn't get to do at the last one, but I was ready because I was fully dressed up like him in a Blitzcrank costume. <laughs> so if with, I had to face with, him... With, with the big beard and the bike with the beard, and I, I took his list and I took a definitely not Blitzcrank. So I psychologically prepared myself for it, but it's <laughs> you don't have to always do that. It's just there's also that game of knowing that you have to adapt for the person you're playing across the, the table. And that's not what we're really saying here. We're saying adapt to the style of army that you think you're going to have to face. If they're a castle, if they're a death star, or if they're a board control kind of army, and then you can sandbox that too with your deployment. So go back to the beginning slide and be like, Hey, how would I move? If this was, if I was facing an aggressive army or if I was facing a castle or when I get more in their face or when I get less in their face. And that's, you want to do that before you even define, before you, because we all know Iron Jaws as we said they are, but you want to have a general concept before you try to apply real life experiences, because then you have a better chance of knowing where you messed up. You have a theory, you have a test and it's, I believe in the scientific theory and, and how it actually works. And so once you test your your hypothesis it gives you a better chance if you first define the hypothesis before you try to test it and that's the thing i was trying to get people to do here today was define what you want your army to do before you put it on the table because the deployment phase is the phase in which you you show your opponent your cards kind of you kind of show them what you're going to do um a little bit not all the way but enough to where you can lose in the deployment phase and so yeah and you know like in this particular photo um if the iron jaws player was i don't know five drops and the idk was one drop then this deployment might not be the best one because you could get a jump onto them you could deny their charges um but it, but if you know that iron jaws are going to beat you in the deployment and they're one drop and your seven drops then yeah, you don't have control. So castling up might be the way to go. So just one one change between just list drops 
could fundamentally change the way deployment happens here. Uh, and I'm not saying this is bad or good. I'm just saying that this is a way that you've adapted to your opponent and some considerations that that you might want to consider. Uh, yeah, you always you you don't want to adapt until you know what you're going to do. No, and you, and you're thinking through. You know, I'm just going to quickly go through this one. Is it's more about not just about what you're going to do in this turn. And you know, this is a chess player. Chess players is thinking one step at a time. But you've got a rough plan. But you're not too fixated on the plan that you're going to move up. You're going to try to take apart certain pieces. But knowing that the double turn, and this is where the double turn can really throw people off, is they have a plan until it crashes. And I'm like, I'm going to do all this. I'm going to win the priority role. I'm going to continue steamrolling my opponent. But often I get caught off guard and I haven't got a defensive plan or I've um, I've been too aggressive and I lose the priority role. And then my opponent can capitalize on my mistakes, which kind of leads to really what I want to kind of pass the bat over to you is, well, how do you use deployment to start preparing for either winning or losing the double turn? Well, you just had a picture of how you destroyed somebody with a double turn right that was your last thing and then the idea that with the double turn in chess is there's called initiative and and so your your last one was the the rest of the pictures of your dock against the fire slayers right and that was where yeah. you you yeah. did you win that yeah so i so i was i was one drop or i was two drops um uh, i gave away first i won the priority role so i went i i, I had a double turn um and obviously steamrolled the head right but if I lost, if I lost, I still had tools that were there to not worry about it. Because, you, yeah, you had Marathi right up there in the top right corner. So you had the ability to where he was still not fully in range to make all of his charges. And if he did, you could still kind of wrap around and hit him and your hag queen is not exposed. Correct. And Marathi can can hold and, and pin. Um, I had the Cauldron of Blood who could do the four-up rally. So even if Witch Elves did start to die, um, I'd pull back enough that they were out of combat um, and then use the four-up uh, redeploy, is it rally, sorry, to bring those Witch Elves back and, and to go fight. So I had a defensive plan if I lost the priority rule. If, if, and you see it in your bottom right-hand corner picture, how your bubbles are still there with your hag queen and everything right there. And, and your bubble was there from however it worked. And that's, it, it, I believe that the double turn is very important because in chess where there's no double turn, white wins 10% of the time or 9% of the time, just because they just get to keep initiative and they get to control initiative means you control what your opponent has to do so if i move on to the objective then you have to try to take the objective from me if i have the ability to teleport behind you then you have to screen behind me initiative is where you're making your opponent do something against what you're doing and that's a very important concept in this and i was trying not to touch on it to it till the end because it's it's why the double turn matters so much to me because you have to plan for that. You have to plan for the idea that you don't get the initiative. And that's just, that's beautiful. That's amazing to me. Um, and so I, in the next slides, have examples of how I have bested a double turn. I, I've faced the guy like three times. And it's it's just the idea that you you kind of plan your turns out. And so you, you before get clear before before we get to that, I'm like a stripper. I'm being thrown cash. So Zach's throwing me some more cash. I've got to acknowledge Zach. Thank you. Like I do my little dance. Um, Zach asking, and that's a good question, actually. Um, am I crazy or do you think that new gen General's Handbook missions seem to let the person who goes first uh, go up early on points um, on primaries compared to the last book? So what's your answer first? Because I do have a quick answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll just start off the ball to say that I think this general's handbook is um, rewarding players to be more aggressive than previously. So in the last general's handbook, you could do your first battle tactic was just three move, run three models. And there was a couple of ones that were more passive and, and less required you to get onto the objective to move up forward more. So in that case, I do think so, especially because there are more battle plans that give away extra victory points in some capacity. What are your thoughts? Again, it's it's my bias. So my bias is going to say the exact opposite. Um, and, and in the sense that I think the way that the battle plans and the way that they are 
constricted for the new GHB is <laughs> um, he's just head bobbing. Um, the the to to go for hordes. So obviously we're pushed towards going towards hordes, but because cities was so dominant and alpha strikes were so dominant, where you don't get to actually like we didn't touch on it too much, but I would play turn one alpha strike to where my opponent needed the double they they felt like if they didn't get the double they weren't going to win the game that's that's because i could kill about 600 points about a third of your army you know in the in the alpha and that that isn't a good game it it, it i i've i've done it i've played it a hundred times um i rarely had an opponent have a good time with it because it's just I, I show to them that I know their pieces and where they made a mistake. And then I show how I, I'm going to utilize that like in the first turn. And that shouldn't really happen in the first turn. Like it, it, it should happen in the third turn, but I think they're trying to go away from that. And so what they've done is they've given us the ability to turn off objectives. They've given us more of an incentive to not want a double turn and to not, because the alpha strike had to be so strong that it didn't matter if you took a double. Now you can take an alpha, but you don't need to be so strong. Like they took away the double tap Raptors, not having as much and the, the pinning pieces of the dragons. And so there's, those are my pieces that I've used. And so I'm like, I think that they're trying to stop us from that heavy alpha strike. You can still alpha strike with a piece, but you can't alpha strike your whole army like you used to is what I think they're trying to, avoid and so uh it makes me feel like you're not trying to score i, I guess you're still trying to score objectives for going first so it's not an answer to the question but it's it's, well, it's interesting it's, because like a lot of this comes to list building as well right because i play a very heavy gladian veterans right my last list i was running 120 goblin stabbers let alone all the heroes that supported right so i'm racking up those points really quickly and trying to get as much lead as possible knowing that you're about to do double damage to my GVs. But if you were a bounty hunter list, different story. So I think it depends on the kind of style that you're playing. And I think at the moment we have too heavy focus on, on bounty hunters. And I think the pendulum will swing at some point that GVs will start standing up. I think right now it's just too he bounty hunter heavy. But Well, you, you can't score two of your battle tactics without GVs, right? Like... Yeah, and yeah, so it's, absolutely. It's, it's geared, it's trying to gear towards that, but it's funny because now the hunt's gone, so the giants, the thing that was stopping people from taking giants is gone, and and giants love eating hordes, so it's just like... Except it, except you have, the you have the proving grounds, which stops a, a gargant, because a gargant doesn't have any GVs to score to begin with, so... And then you have that... That's so beautiful about it, though. This is just that it's it, it's a tit for tat for tit for tat, and and then and if you remember that, then it makes it so okay. Giants will have a hard time, but until people remember how to start using proving ground the right way, it's not you know. And so giants are going to come back up for a little bit. And I'm seeing them come back up too, and people are excited about it because it's people are taking more galley vets because they think that, and it's finding that balance with it. And if it's only going to be six months too, that's I like how they're shaking it up like that too. So it's just. It, it gives people more of a chance to play different styles. And um, that's what makes that makes for better games. My, my favorite games are the ones where I alpha striked, they survived, and we had to play all five games. And then all, all five rounds. And it, it, Four rounds, yeah. It really came down to dice. By the way, no Don, perfect uh, as well. And that's part of the reason why I think that gets, uh, well, gets, but GVs in general are about to rise is that everyone's gone so aggressive to bounty hunters that people are steering away from GVs. So people are going to start dropping bounty hunters soon because if if my only GVs are like 10, 10, wound, 10 wound units total, I don't need them. I don't need to put a bounty hunter and I, I'm, I'm minimum three drops. So look, um, I think the pendulum will swing and that's the beauty of the meta. Anyway, we are absolutely off track. I want to go to your example. So we talked a little bit about how I battle, uh, 
you know, thinking about deployment, building around deployment, and then how a, a, a double turn or winning priority could kind of work in your favor. But you have an example where you were preparing to potentially lose the battle play or the, the, the deployment or things like that. Anyway, talk to me more about yeah, your that's, example. That's, that's exactly what happened. I played my buddy Dan. Uh, this is at the tournament I went to this last week, and it was a small three round RTT. Um, this was my, it, it sucked because it was our first round and I, I already beat him three times before this round. So he was like, okay, I know exactly what I need to do and hopefully it'll work for me. Um, and he had to play for a double and, and he knew that. So you see him in the top left corner, just, just scrunched behind his boat. He's not even on an objective right now, you know? And he's just like, okay, I don't even want to let him try to come at me because, and it, it was, it, it's a little too scrunched. Um, I, I talked to him about it after too. And it's just, he's, a little too far back, like like how the other IDK player we saw was just behind his boat and still could fight for the middle. He chose a side, so I got to choose a side, and I take I keep that side for the whole game. Um, knowing this, yep. <laughs> um, I planned on him getting the double. Like I actually did plan on it too because I. I just feel some of the time you just know it's going to happen because the last two times he didn't get it too. And that he's no, I beat him the first time and we played two more times and he's always out dropped me because I'm taking 10 to 11 drops and he knew he always out dropped me. So I put, I messed up and I put just my hex wraiths up forwards, as you see in the right side, um, next to the purple sun, I cast out the purple sun and I have, uh, my chain rasps. I, I did the, I, this is my first RTT of the new book. So I, I did the objective where I, I had to have a GV on the, the thing and I screwed up. So I had to put my chain rasps there too. So I actually added an extra layer, which worked out in my benefit for the long run, because all I knew is I needed to have my hex rates up forward enough to where he had to go through them almost twice through his movement phase. And that's the main point of this example is that your screens need to also cross into the line of pinning your opponent into their backfield. And so I took as much space. And if you see how my chain rasps are on the objective, I can pull in a way to where he can almost not go onto the objective unless he charges onto those chain rasps and they're actually towing them. And even then it becomes a hard thing unless he kills all of them because he has to go around them to put his toe onto the objective. So you can put your pieces right on the edge of the objective so that you don't let your opponent onto it. Do you want to say something on that or just, yeah. And so no, no, that's no, no, the no. first two slides. So you see, I, I moved. I was just going to add one small thing as well. I just want to call out, you can see where the, um, the IDK play has used the train as well as a defensive castle. You, you've really defended with the bushes to the top left-hand corner. You've got this rock piece kind of in the center. Then they've also got the boat there as well. So that blocks up a lot of the, that blocks up a lot of uh of charge distances too and it also reduces the amount of models that could charge if they did charge so um a, gr a great little way to to tap into the terrain in in our meta as you see those two pieces okay i'm gonna go like so it's like this you see the two top pieces those are garrison pieces so those are actually impassable to us the two rocky hills and then the the two on the far far the green rocks um that are just pieces those are also impassable in our meta and then in between them are tiny little like azurite ruins in our meta you're gonna see either four impassable pieces in the very center blocking off all the lanes or two impassable pieces in the very center blocking off half of the lanes like i did right there and i knew i didn't want to block off the lanes i got the choice and so i put the impassable pieces on the outside and it's just people know that they either want to block up the middle or they want to unlock the middle from the impassable terrain we always have two garrison two impassable so we, we don't we as a community probably don't do enough with defensible and and garrisonable and you know all of those different styles i don't think we have enough that defines the terrain so it's, um we in socal we pride ourselves in like we're not the best at certain things but we are the best at pushing each other to be very meta and it's 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 weird because we're kind of off meta to some people but we are there's a lot of very competitive people in san diego and in in la that and and tom being just such a great to it's it's really made us define terrain clearly 
And it's something that the game is lacking a lot of, and that's why we had to do it. And so it, if I'm going to toot our horn a little bit, I think it's, it's very much that we are ahead of the curve with the terrain thing because we had to be, we, we like to be. So, yeah, I, I think I, I don't get jealous with 40 K very often. And that is one area that I am jealous with in regards to how they define terrain and how they make terrain more, more meaningful than just cover and the six pieces of inspiring arcane, blah, blah, blah. We, we had Scott, anyway. the other big TO, make an awesome little suggestion last time where he gave it to the defender to choose where the myster mysterious terrain comes on. It's not in the GHB. It was just something that he was like, oh, hey, we're going to add a little extra caveat to the terrain piece of it. And so that's, but getting sidetracked, it's, it's mainly that I could have used the terrain to also block for the double turn, but my army is a swarming army, so I need as much space in the middle as I can, and I need my lanes not blocked by terrain so that's why i brought that up that i actually i got the choice of where those two green rocks went on the outside and i chose to put them on the outside in my fulminators army i would have put them in the inside because i like my lanes to be blocked in the middle so yeah no i like it and you're kind of baiting them into the objectives otherwise they're not going to score to begin with um be kind of as the battle kind of progresses are we still in turn one here or so are we, are we now that was my turn two? one. I, he gave me turn. You know, I, I cast, uh, I forgot to say, I did the minus one to wound spell on my hex rates. Um, and then uh, what was funny was he discharged order wrong. So um, he wanted to put his Achillean King in there, which is the guy behind that three inch little stick. Um, what he did is he charged in his thralls first. Um, and then he charged in his eels. Uh, he he shot me too. So the first picture is the picture of after the shots. So that's what happened to my hex rates. There's many different ways. I actually, um, because I knew I was going to be on here, I, I pulled the hex rates two different ways to show. I, I cut the picture out, but you can, you, I could have pulled the hex rates the other way to have him have another layer of things that he had to go through right there. But I thought, oh, wait, no, he's going to kill everything in that area. So I'm going to make the hex rates not be in the fight range so i pulled them to i pulled from the left and to the right you know and so th there's only the two left of the five that were there initially when he charged in with his eels and this is why i say he messed up he unloaded the eel thing that shocks the chain rasps and did eight more wounds <laughs> and i didn't save a single one and so he just there was only eight right there and he killed all of them and and he, he wanted to charge still with the other unit of three eels and the other killing keys so he lost out and this is a lot of times people don't realize how much movement you get extra from charge. And like you have a six inch model that only moves six inches, but you can charge 10 inches. That thing's going to move 10 inches when it charges. And it's just, it's weird. So he missed out because he unloaded his eels on, on it. And it was just, it was just a basic new player mistake. Um, any, any player who's played it enough will know that they're going to kill those rasps with three units of things going into them. Maybe you'll lose an eel from the rasps. Maybe it won't matter because all that, that extra 10 inches of movement between the king and the other eels will matter more than losing that one eel that could happen, you know? And so that was, that was where I got really lucky right there. Um, from that mistake of, of him charging and killing the chain wraps and not getting a charge in the other pieces. And so his other pieces weren't further up where they needed to be for the next turn. He wins the double and we can go to the next slide. Oh, and I have my, my last little thing is my purple sun. I'm also using the purple sun in the top right corner as a movement blocker. So his turtle, which you see behind the rock cannot go over his own ship wreck because i moved my purple sun just in range we had to measure it twice to not let his turtle land right there because the purple he would land on the purple sun so it was it's its own movement blocker it's not giving any minuses to save it's not killing anything it's blocking a lane and it's doing exactly what it needed to do because then his turtle comes in on the top left corner as you see in my two last hex rates redeployed backwards they got a i think a three or a four inch so they came back I tried to rally them too, did not get a single one of them back. So that's that's the thing, the double turn. You have your two units up forward that are going to take the hit. In, in the top right corner, you can see I put Blade Gas down too to also try to distract him. That's where his white blob of not painted thralls are trying to fight something in the top right corner. And But the, the fight happens now. Okay, so we're now... We skip the opening because he knows he's going to get the double turn. We, don't, we both don't get to open for two turns. We have... 
him open and go into the middle. And he chooses how to go to the middle instead of me getting another turn of in chess, what we'd call the opening and before we get to the middle game where everything's being traded. OK, but all he can trade, as you see in the right hand picture, is his stuff into my two hex rates and my blade guys that I have on the top. So that's that's kind of my way of explaining how to prepare for a double turn is push forward your piece of 300 points or 500 or whatever you have for your chaff away from the rest of your army so far away from the rest of your army that when they get the double and then if you want to go to the next one so you can see he's in the middle and stuff like that but in the next ones you'll see what happens after i get my turn so my turn is the bottom left hour um yeah <laughs> and um you see Lady O, so I didn't say it, but the garrison, I had all my guys in the garrison, all my important buff pieces, and I had to take them out of the garrison um, to charge from the, the left-hand side. But he he had cleared the two hex rates easily, and he cleared the unit of 10 blade guys that were in the top right corner, but that's it. And in his double turn, he really had only cleared about three to 400 points, and I still had about 1,500 points left. So... This is the image of my turn, uh, bottom of turn two. And then the next one is after my movement phase in um, turn three, because after I got all my charges off and I was able to minus Night Hunt is just amazing right now with what they can do, um, because the game is about choosing when to trade. And if you can turn off an opponent getting to trade first and make them fight last, then you really make it so easy to choose when to trade. So that's why Night Hunt is in such a good place because the, the strike last is the best part. Um, but yeah, it's just, I was able to then double into him and we, we called it there because he knew it was over at that point. So, and I, th and I think as well, like the other part is, you know, as I bring up some other photos of examples of, of deployment, if you, if you get a really good deployment and you have a really good first turn because, you know, pieces are moving up and, and doing their thing appropriately and what your, what your plan was is being executed, which is great, you don't have to rely on the priority role going into turn two. And there's been plenty of times where you just give it away because you're in such a good spot, you're in your auras, you've got CP up your sleeve, you know, you're, everything's so good that you're like, you know what, I'm confident I can give it away and I know that I can try for a double turn going in from two to three. Or I, even if I, I, if I lose a priority roll, I don't care. I'm so confident that I'm happy to give it away. And as, as we kind of, you know, start kind of bringing this home, Here's a couple of other examples of people in the Discord who shared off some of their examples. And you can see, you know, Daniel up in the, the top middle, you know, is a Stormcast army. So a lot of their units are off the board. You can see Tub in the, the top left corner being an Iron Jaws focus. You can have layers of attacks as you kind of wave through to your opponents. Um, there are so many different ways. And like another example on the on the right hand side, the Skaven example. You know, you see a lot of them deploying around the gnar holes to teleport around the board and um, and, and reposition and 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 do whatever you want to do. So there's so much science and and art to to an effective deployment. And I think over this two hour stream, we've demonstrated that there's no one way to deploy. A lot of factors come in. Any thoughts or anything you want to kind of add to this? Just, just know yourself before you know your enemy, you know, and that's that's the first thing I think, because you are your first enemy. Yeah, yeah, and and a, a lot of the times yourself. when, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, a lot of a lot of Age of Sigma, and you see this happen a lot where somebody loses a game or they don't do as well in a tournament, and they start making wholesale changes on their list. But a lot of a lot of unlike forty k where the list drives the performance. I feel like Age of Sigma is very much focused towards the micro decisions that are happening throughout the game. And as you learn your army, you make better decisions and you ultimately get better outcomes. So, you know, my advice to you is, is practice, try, try different things, see what happens and how you respond. Don't always deploy on the line, you know, fight over only a couple of objectives, not all of the objectives um, and kind of learn from that and see what happens. I have to give a shout out to all my failure, f fellow scalies is, is the thing that I have to do. So I, I have to say that I wouldn't be player I am without all the people that are in my 
my thing. I Nick Garcia is the first one I have to say because he's the reason I play the game, and then Matt and six other mats or five other mats and Tom, like we've already mentioned, and Noe, and then the Noog is one of the fun ones to bring up, and then Evan is the reason I did my last one. So those are the names I have to drop. Awesome. That well, I, have. I think I dropped other ones. I think the key for me, like if I start bringing this home and summarizing two hours of solid gold, you know, like like take photos. Think about your deployment. Practice it. Practice it in advance. Hell, come onto my Discord, and I'm sure you could probably find out and go, hey, who wants to practice deployment for 30 minutes? And give each other feedback. You could get onto Tabletop Simulator, you know, position things out. You can measure it. You can see if I was to move and run and charge and, and how can I go turn one. There's so much practice you can do so that ultimately when you go to a tournament, you're better prepared. You've got examples, you have reference points, and you know probability and outcomes because you've done it again and again and again. And that's that's the thing I was trying to get people to get to is I I don't get to play enough. I have two kids. Um, I, 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 I'm a small business owner. I, I really don't have a lot of time. The reason I've gotten to the place that I've gotten is that I, I first visualize my goal. I try to achieve it. And then I work on what stopped me. And, and, and you, you, you have to, you start over again from the beginning and then you, you do it all over again, but you don't make the list new. You, 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 you figure out what in it worked and what, you know, and then that's the thing. Like you want to visualize first, then do it and then go. And when you create that visualization, then you can actually work on something that is your own, like your own thought, your own, this is what I want to play with. These are my, and that's the thing that's beautiful about the hobby is we're meeting so many people that are just, it is an art. I, I consider the deployment, the way it moves, how all the models, what the choices that you make for your army is art to me. And that um, everyone's an artist in this game. And it's just, it's fun to meet other brains and how they work. So it's important to use your brain to make it smarter or make it better. And that's that visualization and applying the visualization. So um, that's why we using the visual cues, I, I tried to give that and that's just try to create your own or have your own ways of mental blocking your units so that you it almost becomes second nature when you're putting your pieces down where they're supposed to go. So, yeah. and that's where, and that's where, where I use photos because I take the photo and I remember and I'm like, right, cool. I had this here at this range. I can, I can look at it. And my last piece of advice to everybody here is to get feedback. You know, at the end of the game with your opponent, good, bad, or different, however the game flowed, just go, Hey, Ray, is there anything that you would have done differently if you were me in deployment? And then you could take that same photo that I talked about earlier and put it on Discord, on Twitter, on, on a Facebook group. I've got sub, threat, sub chats on every single army. You could say, hey, this is how I deployed. How would you deploy? What do you do differently? And then all of a sudden you get new ideas from people who have experience as well. So, you know, use the community to your advantage. Yeah, your community is amazing. I will spend a lot of time in the night hunt chat for, for the next little bit for a while. But, you know, like, uh, again, like you can kind of get experience from people and um, the community is great. They're willing to share. I'm not just in my Facebook. There's, there's, there's chats on Facebook as yes. well. You could ask the Facebook group, hey, this is how I deployed against um, Iron Jaws. They turn on charge. What could I have done differently? How would you have done it? And, you know, they might not be right, but you've got a whole bunch of new ideas that you can practice and try over time. Yeah, especially if you take the picture, like you're saying, if you – if you take the picture, I guess the thing I was trying to add to it was visualize the picture too. You know, visualize where you want those things at, but take the picture. And then if you can, maybe just draw it out on a piece of paper. Hey, this is what I want for my guys to do. Just like I did with the paint. It took me five minutes to do in paint. It's just Microsoft Paint. But you you can make your own bubbles for your guys too. And when I did a team's tournament, I actually made my co-captain do that and i was like hey for your doc army i want you to know your ranges and stuff this is how i plan so you need to do it too and it's just if you want to take it to the competitive level of how to do it deployment is 50 percent of the game it, it's more yeah. than it's it, it's more than a third of the game 100 percent. so I, I still draw out deployments um 
I still do it today, whether it's not just on tabletop simulator, I'll get a piece of paper out. Um, I will get the battle plans on my computer. And then, like I said, use Microsoft or like a Photoshop and I draw on the book. reposition. Oh, I don't draw on the book, but I photocopy <laughs> the book and like you can, but you know, like to, you know, to, to the point here, Nudon, you know, log on to tabletop simulator, fiddle, fiddle the deployment. You can play with yourself or play with somebody else and you could give each other feedback and, and, and play around turn one. It's always more um, fun with someone else. Yeah. Yeah. Play with someone else, not play with yourself. If people want to talk to you and want to kind of like chat with you and, and share ideas, where are you best found on the internet? Through my wife. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, I just, I don't schedule myself. My wife schedules me. So she's like, she's my boss. Um, are you on Twitter? Kill, are you on Facebook? Are you... I'm on, I'm on, I'm on Discord. I don't actually do a lot. Like, um... <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, all right. Well, if you want to get advice, I'm trying to like build your social presence. You're making my life hard. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, all right, I'm dying of this man flu. So, um, yeah, I have to pee any, really bad. So, yeah. Any any final shout outs, and then we'll kind of bring this home. Um. Thank you. You. No, really, you. Like you. Like, I mean this, you are so wholesome. You are just, you are one of those people that the world needs more of um, because you love this and your love comes out when you talk to people. And this is not easy. It's not, it wasn't easy to talk to me. We've, we've gone back and forth trying to figure out how to do this. And this is, you're doing this on your own time. So yeah, thank you for, I mean, you've, you've made me a better player. You, I can't get my glasses straight, but I can get my deployment straight because of listening to you. So thank you. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you, Ray. Um, and hopefully we, we're going to meet at LVO. Is that correct? Are you yep. coming to LVO? Yep. And you're coming to the next O-Town eventually, right? So. <laughs> sure. I can, when I get that agency, get a teleporter, when I can use, personally use Signs of the Storm um, and come to America more often. But I will be at LVO, so I can't wait to meet all you. I'll be in the car with Tom. Uh, oh, awesome. I didn't call him Tomo. Yeah. But you won't and, have um, to drive. No, I'm not driving. I'm driving. Yeah. I'm no, getting it driven itself. by Gareth and um um and the Nog, the Nog. Ooh, All right. the Nog. The yeah, Nug. the Nog, the Nog. All right, I'm literally dying. Um, thank you for for joining the stream. I hope you found this valuable. Um, legitimately, if you have any comments, please leave leave in the comment section and let me know how you think about deployment. If there's something you agree with, something you disagree with. Um, if you play a certain army and the way you think about deployment, I'd love to hear from the community uh, because it is much of a science as much as an art, right? Um, that no two two people do deployment exactly the same. And the way we adapt to, again, ourselves, our opponents, our play style, our lists, our battle plans, our terrain, there's so much that kind of comes into it. I hope through this, this discussion, you have some tools and ideas that ultimately helps make you a better deployer and ultimately helps you win more games. So um, come to Chicago Open. I'm close, but I, it's like it's, it's too close. It's too close. But um, thank you so much. We're going to do an outro. Um, and everybody, thank you. And, um, yeah, I was going to say stay hydrated. But that's, not my, that's not my tagline. Um, don't roll a one on a redeploy. <laughs> Thanks for hanging around until the end. I hope you enjoyed that video and you walked away with a few new ideas. If you did, I would love it if you press like on the video as well as left me a comment to let me know what your thoughts are. The conversation will continue over on Discord and the link is down below in the video description. I want to give a massive shout out as well to the AOS Coach Patreons and YouTube members who are going in and the funds are supporting the channel and the growth that you're seeing here. So cheers, you're all bloody legends. And until next time, don't roll a one on a redeploy.